Chair Rose, we are now live. Good evening. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting. I'm hearing a real echo. Is there something? Uh, regularly scheduled meeting of the City of Elmhurst Zoning and Planning Commission. So uh, before we start, we need, I need to check to make sure that everyone can hear me. And I will do that now. Eileen, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, in the public comment room, can you hear me? Mike in the public comment room. Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the applicants in the applicant room, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Commissioner McCoy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. Commissioner Hoffman, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Commissioner Udiski, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, court reporter Kiki and uh, Andriopoulos, can you hear me? You are muted. Yes, I can hear you, but I do hear an echo, a reverb. I do too, and I'm Thank not you. sure where it's coming from. So. If Mike Stennett, is, is it coming from that, that computer there? No, because that's not in the zoom I don't know if, if Mike Stennett is here, maybe we'll get him to come and check. Uh, Commissioner Snyder, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Commissioner Burns, can you hear me? Yes. Commissioner Garland, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. And Commissioner Pittman, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. I will ask Eileen Franz to please call the roll to establish a quorum. Thank you. Uh, I think we figured out the problem. It was my microphone, my headphones rather. Yeah, I think we're good now. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Burns. Here. Commissioner Calloway is absent. Commissioner Garland. Here. Commissioner Hoffman. Here. Commissioner McCoy. Here. Commissioner Pittman. Here. Commissioner Snyder. Here. Commissioner Ruditsky. Here. Chair Rose. Here. We have a quorum. Um, the next item of business is public comment. Uh, this is the point in our agenda where anyone uh, can make a comment, hopefully zoning related. You have three minutes to make a comment. Uh, I'm gonna ask first, uh, Mike, in the public comment room, is there anyone there who wishes to make a comment? No, there is not. Okay. Eileen, is there anyone who wishes to make a comment? Due to remote connections, we actually keep checking uh, voicemail and email to see if anyone in the public wishes to make a comment. No, there's not. Excellent. Okay. Um, we will then ask, let me ask if there's any written communication. Uh, all the written communication that we've received has been posted to board docs for any case. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the first item of business, we'll then move on to bis our items of business is approval of the minutes of the March 16th Zoning and Planning Commission, uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. Can I have a motion and a second to approve these minutes? So moved, Garland. Commissioner Garland moves. Second. Commissioner Snyder seconds. 
Are there any additions, deletions, corrections that anyone wants to make on these minutes? Okay. Seeing none, I will ask Eileen Franz to please call the roll to approve the minutes. Commissioner Garland. Yes. Commissioner Snyder. Yes. Commissioner Burns. Yes. Commissioner Hoffman. Yes. Commissioner McCoy. Yes. Commissioner Pittman. Yes. Commissioner Ditsky. Yes. Chair Rose. The minutes are approved. Thank you. We'll then move on to the cases in front of us. The first case in front of us is case 21 ZBA, the Lopez variation. Eileen, is that you or Emily? Emily, will you please introduce this case to us? I would be happy to. I would like to let the commission know the applicant is not present at the moment. Uh, when I spoke to the applicant just before the meeting, uh, the applicant was on their way, so I'm happy to proceed, but just... Uh, well, then I, I think we will then move on to the next item. Uh, we really, it, it's a requirement for us that we have the applicant here. Here's so we will, move, we will move on to the next item, which is case 21P05, CE Rentals Conditional Use Permit. And before we take up this item, I'm going to ask Eileen Franz to please uh, just give us an introduction about uh, why this one is a conditional use, in addition to your introduction to the case. Thank you. I don't know, but it was definitely unpleasant. Okay. There's still okay. Now Try there's this an again. echo. And now there's an echo again. So Okay, is this any better? Okay, sorry about that. Not sure what that was. Um, this is case 21P05. Um, originally, it was assigned case number 21ZBA03 because originally we um, expected this case to be variations. Chair Rose, I think you're not muted now, so I'm having some feedback. Thank you. Um, so the applicant is, um, well, I'm sorry, before I forget, the applicant is Robert Sloan of Sloan Property Management, who's the contract purchaser of the property. The legal notice was published March, March 18th, 2021. The sign was posted March 23rd, 2021, and the mailing was sent out March 22nd, 2021. Uh, the applicant is under contract to purchase the former Elmhurst restaurant on Lake Street, and the applicant currently operates c &E Rentals on Route 83. And um, the property is zoned I-1, and the I-1 zoning district does allow outdoor storage, um, provided that it is screened into the rear of the property. This property is a little unique. Um, it's in a regular shape, and it's a through lot. So originally, we discussed the possibility of requesting variations for the outdoor storage, because Though outdoor storage is allowed, it is not allowed in the required setbacks. And this, because of the way this property narrows um, as it goes to the north, it would be difficult to, um, the applicant believes it would be difficult to meet the setbacks and, you know, use the property um, as they functionally want to use it. So we discussed the um, situation with the city attorney because there's a provision in the zoning ordinance under the conditional uses that states other manufacturing, processing, storage, or commercial uses determined by the Zoning and Planning Commission to be of the same general character as the use is permitted in subsection A and found to be in compliance with all the pertinent performance standards contained in subsection 22.221C. So subsection A is, you know, our list of permitted uses. Um, we've determined that the applicant's use is a permitted use. Um, it is, like I stated, he does um, equipment rental 
and some sales. So though it's not specifically listed, um, we determined that it can be classified as a building materials and supplies dealer, contractor, um, and machine sales office. And since outdoor storage is permitted, we um, thought rather than having the applicant request variations to store in the setbacks, a conditional use would be a more appropriate way to do this because in this case, the app or the commission and the city council could add conditions to the applicant's request if you see that, if you see a need for that, which would not be allowed with variations. Um, for example, the applicant is going to request is as part of this is requesting that um, there can be some display of equipment in the front of the property during business hours. That's not something that could be accommodated in a variation, but that could be a com that can be accommodated in a conditional use permit with a condition. So, um, sort of a brief overview. Since I've been here, we've never had a conditional use under this particular. Um, provision in the industrial district. I'm not sure if we had one previously, but I just wanted to give a little explanation since none of you have probably seen, seen this type of request before. And the applicant is on Zoom with us tonight. Okay, I see Mr. Sloan. So um, before we start, uh, what I'd like to do is ask the court reporter <clears throat> to swear in anyone who wishes to speak on this case. And in the uh, service of efficiency, I will ask any applicant for any other case uh, to please be sworn in at this time. So uh, would you please raise your right hand, anyone who is going to testify tonight? And I'll ask the court reporter to please swear you in. Do solemnly swear or affirm that all the testimony about to give in any of these cases will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Sloan, who is the applicant here, to please uh, give us an idea about uh, what you're planning, uh, why the conditional use, why the current um, really land use regulations would not uh, really need modification uh, in this case. And if anyone is watching uh, at home on YouTube, the applicant will really first give us uh, their idea. We'll then take any public testimony. So if for some reason you want to give public testimony, uh, you would need to what, email Eileen? You would need to email Eileen Franz. Um, and then after that point, we will um, then have some questions from the commission and we will then close the public hearing at that point. So, so Mr. Sloan, give us an idea what you're thinking for this uh, former property, the Elmhurst, formerly the Elmhurst restaurant. You are muted, Mr. Sloan. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Okay, uh, let's see, I've lost you, but um, good evening, everyone. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to review my application um, that I presented in front of you. Uh, I'll just give you a little quick history of me and my company. Uh, my name is Robert Sloan. Uh, I've lived in Elmhurst my entire life. Uh, I own and operate CE Rentals. We've been on the very Southwest corner of Elmhurst for roughly 32 years now. Um, and what we do for business is we sell and rent construction equipment. And what I mean by construction equipment is uh, we really uh, focus on compact equipment. So realistically, anything you can put in the back of a pickup truck or carry on the back of a trailer with a pickup truck. Um, we don't go through anything really large and we don't go through uh, anything really small. Um, you know, like carpet cleaners, nothing like that. So really just focus on construction equipment and the light construction or compact equipment as we, um, and one of the things is I've been here uh, roughly for about 25 years at this specific location. Um, and for probably the last 20 years, I've been uh, very actively looking for a new location as we've outgrown this one. Um, part of the, uh, 
you know, not only do I need uh, more land and, and a little bit bigger of a building, um, but I also wanted to stay in Elmhurst. I'm a lifelong resident. My children go to the school here. Um, I currently live in Elmhurst. Um, so trying to bridge all those gaps of finding the right property and finding something in Elmhurst was not as easy, but I identified this property, uh, which is zoned in the industrial district. I'm currently in the C3 district over on Route 83. Um, so I felt that this would be a little bit more favorable to our company uh, moving into the industrial area. Um, and then also combining the fact that we do do some retail sales um, and have a retail type business. So uh, having that frontage on Lake Street, I found to be uh, very valuable as well as you know being there. Um, so when I uh, identified this property and put it under contract, um, one of the things that I found out is that you know our typical uh, we have a lot of tractors, like we would call them bobcats or mini excavators. Um, and so I need a place to park them at night inside the parking lot, inside of a fenced in area um, for security. So uh, when we identified this property, uh, speaking with the city, we realized that there's a 20 foot setback surrounding the entire property that we would not be able to park our equipment in at night. Um, I could park a car there, but I couldn't park a tractor. Um, so that's what the biggest reason why we came here in front of you tonight is to ask for a conditional use to be able to park our equipment. And our plan is that we would fence in the entire property um, and then we would park our equipment inside the fenced in area where it would not be seen um, at night. Uh, the second question that we had was that there's currently a fence running along Fisher Farm Road um, that the neighbor has. So what I'd like to do is extend that and bring our fence all the way across the back of our property also. Um, there's a conflict in the code that says that if I wanna park equipment inside the yard, that it has to be with an eight foot fence that is uh, covered so that you can't see through it. Uh, the other part of the code says because it's a frontage on Fisher Farm Road that I would need a four foot fence that you can see through. So that would not provide me any level of security if I did do that. Um, there is currently a, uh, a six or seven foot chain link fence next door to me that that customer, uh, my neighbor is using. Um, so I felt that if we just extended that one uh, down the exact same line that that would fit appropriately. Um, one of the other things is this property is very uniquely shaped. The back half of the property, when it comes down to Fisher Farm Road is 54 feet wide. And the current rule says that I am not allowed to use 20 feet on the left or 20 feet on the right on each side of the property. So it really only leaves me 14 feet down the middle of the property that I can use to park my equipment in, um, which would make uh, the property very inefficient, not as safe, and would not allow me to have a, a good traffic flow, which I'll explain to you later. Um, so that uh, is one another uh, very big reason. And then my third request as part of this, uh, just to break it down into three parts, was during the day, I'd really like the opportunity to display my equipment on, Lake, uh, on the front of the building on Lake Street um, for customers and just to advertise our business um, and what we do here in Elmhurst. So uh, I felt that the display is consistent. Um, you know, Lake Street is, you know, basically an industrial corridor. There's a lot of car dealerships. There's the Caterpillar dealership down the road that for years has always had their equipment parked up along the curb line for people for display and for people to, to know what they do at their business. So um, I'm currently planning on utilizing the existing parking lot area um, we're not going to expand it. We're not going to change it. Um, there's currently a uh, like a, a drive-through or a, in the front of the building where, um, because it was a restaurant where someone could drop you off at the front door. So there's kind of like a drive-through road between the two parking lots in the front of the building that we would just repurpose and use uh, for equipment in the morning. And then before we close, we would move the equipment back in at the end of the night uh, for storage and for safekeeping. Um, on it. I've also have a couple of uh, uh, drawings, if Eileen could put them up, uh, if that's possible. 
uh, which I believe are attached to your packet um, and just kind of shows, uh, you know, the outline of the property and uh, what we are trying to do here that I can explain. Emily, can you give me the um, host privileges so I can share my screen? And Robert, can you tell me which one you would like me to put up first? Do you have a preference? Um, you could put either one up, but I could try. I think number two, there's a two okay. on it. Mm This one? Okay. So this is what is the current situation. Um, and what I showed here in the red is the area which I am, if I were to purchase this property as is, uh, the red area is the area that I would be able to park my equipment at night um, if I put up a fence and put it inside the fenced in area. As you can see, there's a 20 foot wide perimeter all the way around the entire property that I really could not use for storage unless it was a vehicle. Then I could park the vehicle there all night. Um, but so my uh, uh, architect just brought this out as an option to me that if I was to uh, take the property as is, and as you can see, there's an entrance and an exit on Lake Street. So in this proposal, if I were to keep it as is, uh, my my customers would drive in, they would go behind the building, get whatever equipment they need, and then they would turn around and exit back out onto Lake Street. Um, the 20 feet on either side of the property, I could then use for uh, employee parking, if that were the case. Um, to me, this is not very safe and this is very inefficient. Um, my proposal, Eileen, if you could go to the next page. Yes. Uh, so th yeah, that was just an aerial view. Yeah. I think it's the SK. Yeah, try that one. Let's see. Yeah, so here's my proposal. Um, on it, maybe we can make it a little bit smaller. Um, so in this instance, if we were allowed to park in the setback, realistically, what I really want to do is the majority of my customers have a pickup truck and a trailer, or even sometimes a small dump truck and a trailer. So they would enter in off of Lake Street, which would be on the east side of the property, and they would drive past my building a little bit, park where we would be able to load or unload the equipment that they wanted, and then they would proceed north and exit out Fisher Farm Road. Um, to me, this would be the best case scenario. What I really liked about this property was that Fisher Farm Road, if you take a right or a left, you end up on Church or you end up on Walnut. And both of those intersections have a stoplight going back to Lake Street. So that means all my trucks, as well as my customers' trucks, will have a stoplight to be able to take a right or left-hand turn, which I believe is a very safe, um, instead of trying to take a left-hand turn out of this property onto Lake Street. Um, and as you can see, we penciled in the rest of it as red, which would mean where we would store equipment. It probably wouldn't take up this much space. Uh, my proposal here, if you look along that long strip on the right-hand side of red, that would be our what we would call our ready to rent line. So we would display our equipment there that's ready to go, washed and fueled and whatever for the customers. And as they drove in, they would be able to see all of our equipment that we have to offer. So I think that would be very helpful in promoting our, our business. It would allow multiple spaces here behind the building if there were multiple trucks and trailers. Um, up here by behind the building, it gets pretty wide. And the other thing that I really uh, would like to do if, if, if my proposal is granted is, I would on the left side of the building, you can see where it says new one story addition. Um, we would like to add about 1500 square feet to the building there. Um, and by doing that, I would seal off the west parking lot 
and I would utilize, there's 12 spaces on this drawing. Um, the fence would go right up to the building. It wouldn't leave a buffer between the building and the fence, but, um, and that would allow me 12 additional spots there for employee parking. So my employees would be able to park in kind of like the employee lot, would walk over to the front door when they come into work, and all of my customers and the traffic would come in off of Lake Street and for the most part, make it a one way out to uh, Fisher Farm Road. You can also see in the front of the building where it says existing overhang, um, there is a blacktop road that's about, I think maybe 14 feet wide that connects these two parking lots or you could drive all the way around the building if you currently, if you want. Um, and that would be our display area. So that would also, I think, work very well in our, because that would eliminate any customers who wanted to just park there quickly and then return back to Lake Street. I really want them to come inside the fenced in area and then be able to talk to my employees and the counter and, and, and help with their needs and then exit safely out the back. Um, you know, I've looked at so many properties in the last 15 or 20 years and, and nothing's perfect. Uh, they all have a question and, and a problem. Um, but I really feel that this property would allow me to stay in Elmhurst and would also benefit the community. Um, I read the, uh, as I put in the report, um, there was a uh, study done by the city of Elmhurst for the Lake Street corridor. Um, and I believe that in it, in it, it said in the, app, in the brochure, which it, it's funny because the brochure identified this property as a highly used of C3, which I'm currently in C3 and I'm current, you know, rental equipment and is listed as a, as a permitted use in C3. So I thought that was pretty interesting that that was in there. Um, but the, uh, the city of Elmhurst uh, uh, Lake Street corridor, you know, said to promote businesses um, that have some commercial use and also benefit the community. And I feel that having equipment rental like this certainly benefits the community. A good majority of my customers come from this community. Um, so I feel that that would be very helpful. And lastly, I would suggest that I'm in a very congested area right now on Route 83 on the frontage road on the south end of Elmhurst. Um, we have that new project coming in with the Keith brothers that's being redeveloped into the Amazon style warehouse there. Um, one of the problems with this area is I not only have a school next door to us, uh, one building over, um, it's a very thin road. We get a lot of traffic down here. And when that new warehouse comes in, it's going to increase the problems that they have are currently with that intersection on Riverside Drive. If you're familiar with it, uh, when you go eastbound off of 83 on Riverside Drive, you have four choices that you can go north, northwest, southwest, or northeast, southeast, and then south. And there's really only about one or two car spots there if you wanted to turn on to 83. So I feel that I'll also help benefit this area by leaving and reducing some of that traffic flow um, around the school and also at that stoplight, uh, which will probably become more congested. So I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, I hope, that, I guess I could put one other point too. I did contact both my neighbors. Um, I spoke with uh, Mr. Sheely at Elmhurst Toyota who owns the property across the street from me, as well as to the west of me. Uh, he told me personally that he did not have a problem with it um, and that he would support this. I believe he's also called into the city and made that similar request. Um, and I also spoke with the owner, uh, Mr. Hill at Superior Ambulance. Uh, he felt that what I was asking was very reasonable. He asked me to follow up with him with an email, with a drawing. And so I provided these drawings to him uh, and I did not hear back from him. Um, and as I said, the west side of the property currently is a warehouse with a parking lot and is completely fenced in. The east side of the property is the Superior Ambulance Building, which is about a four or five story office building. But th the side of the building that I face is currently their loading dock, where they keep their dumpsters and where they keep their standby generator power. So. I don't believe it would be any impact to them. Uh, and then behind me is also a set of loading docks for a warehouse uh, on the other side of Fisher Farm Road. So um, I appreciate your time and I'd be well, more than willing to answer any questions. OK, 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, Eileen, can you mute? Please, thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Mr. Sloan. Is there anything else you wanna mention around, since this will be a conditional use, uh, any of the seven standards for conditional use? Or uh, you don't have to, but I'm just curious if there's any one of those you wanna pay any attention to. I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm having trouble with my phone here. That's okay. Um, but you know, the I'm seven standards. On, on the landline here real quick. Okay. <laughs> Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. Enter your participant ID. Please enter the meeting ID. You are in the meeting now. There are 15 participants in the meeting. You are muted. You, you are muted. You are muted. Okay, let's see how that's gonna work, Mr. Sloan. I don't know how that will work. Um, so I just was asking you if there's any one of the seven uh, standards for conditional use you wanted to address specifically, or you don't have to, but if, if you had thought to do that. You, I, Mr. Sloan, you are muted. We cannot hear you. How's that? Can you hear me? Can hear you now. Great. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. I apologize. I'm on Zoom all day long, and I never had a problem. And I don't know why tonight. It you know, did this not is the work. Um, this this is the joys of remote meetings. So don't, yes. don't um, just carry so I did, on. I did uh, answer. You know, in my application, I tried okay. to address all seven of the conditional use standards, and, and I tried to touch on them tonight without being redundant on it. Um, okay, that's fine. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to address any of those specifically if they have a question. All right, I, I'm going to actually start out with a question because I remember when you were in front of the commission um, for your current place at that point, uh, and there was a lot of concern about um, the noise from moving, et cetera. I understand your desire to make a move because you are you are abutting some residential area there now, are you not? Yes, I am. So uh, the last time I came in front of the committee, we originally started with a rezoning application um, as the property was being subdivided by a developer. Um, and then it changed into a conditional use. And I was granted the conditional use to yep. park the equipment on what I would call like a remote lot that was abutting our property. That's right. right. Um, and we had a, a laundry list of do's and don'ts. and um, I'm happy to say that uh, I've had that conditional use for 20 plus years, I think, uh, and never had a complaint about anything since. Really, it's been that long? Jeez, my how, my how time flies, yeah. I remember that. So, um, yeah, I was just curious how that's gone because we I don't think we've heard anything of that either. So, okay, let me open it up to members of the commission. Does anyone have a question or a comments they want to make okay. at this point? Commissioner Snyder. Thank you, Chair Rose. Um, yes, I. how many um, pieces of equipment would you be moving to the front of the building each day? It, um, I would uh, I would anticipate that there's probably only room for about three to four pieces. Um, and it depends on how small they get. I wouldn't put anything very small up there that you know someone could just grab. Um, it would be a smaller tractor, but probably anywhere from maybe three or four at the most. I don't believe there's any more room than that. And that would be positioned right in front of what is the restaurant now in that in that drive aisle. Yes. How far away from the street is that setback? Um, that I, I believe it's about 12 feet of grass right now. And currently you could put a car there. Um, but I would, you know, put that it would be between the two uh, entrance and the uh, the egress for on Lake Street, so it would be in between the two of them. 
And would there be any interference in terms of uh, obstructing visibility for employees who might be entering or exiting that, that designated employee parking area? I don't believe so. I think that you would have a clear view site um, with that the equipment would be far enough back and it would be small enough back. It doesn't, you know, uh, you know, it, it, I don't think it would block the view. Okay, and then in the uh, zoning ordinance regulations, there's a, a requirement that no stored materials should be shall be visible above the fence. So how tall is some of your equipment? I mean, what's the, the highest, um, what's the, the, the largest height of some of your equipment? I, I believe that the highest is probably right around seven to seven and a half feet. And we've requested an eight foot fence, which is what was required in the zoning. That's why we, we put that in there. Um, you know, the, the zoning asks for an eight foot fence with a uh, covered. Okay, so, uh, you know, just I took a quick look at at your property right now and it looks like you have some, some lifts and some excavators, uh, maybe some drum rollers, that kind of thing. And all of that equipment's less than eight feet in height? Uh, yes, first I do not have any lifts at all. Um, and when we, you know, if you're looking at, I don't know what you're looking at right now, but, um, if you look at pictures, obviously if I put like the bucket up in the air, then it would be higher than eight feet. Um, but when we store it in the parking lot, we would not do that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Which raises a question for me. Um, are you, I don't think you're currently displaying equipment in the front, are you in your? Yes, we are. So every okay. single morning, um, so yeah, I must pretty, have been by there when you didn't have it, okay. Yeah, we're pretty crowded over here. So um, part of our, uh, to be able to open up in the morning is we got to move some trucks and some equipment out. Um, but yes, every day we put about four or five pieces out in front currently. So you would be talking about three pieces every day? Yeah, I don't, I, I think I have more room here than I would have there. Um, hmm, right, okay. And the fact that I now have my customers driving through my lot and I have what we would call the ready to rent line on the right hand side of the east side of the property. Um, you know, that is really going to be my display area once they're inside the fence thin yard. Okay. You know, I would, Commission, I would have some equipment out front just for people driving by that maybe don't know we're there, um, just to give them an idea. Now, if you remember, the Caterpillar dealer down the street has like a, a Always corral. Did. Right. of steel pipes that they would, and they would just leave it there all night. They would have maybe eight to 10 pieces. And they had, you know, their smaller stuff there, kind of like, you know, similar to what I would have, not the real big iron that they put in the back or put up on uh, Grand Avenue there up on the hill. Right, okay. Commissioner Pittman, did you have a question? Thank you, Chair Rose. Um, yes, um, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Sloan. I had a question, a follow-up, um, on one of the questions Commissioner Snyder had asked regarding the height of the equipment. You said um, seven, seven and a half feet. Um, your fence though is, looks like six feet of chain link and then two feet of barbed wire. So I guess I have a concern that that two feet of barbed wire isn't necessarily gonna provide the coverage for the equipment at that top. I guess I have some concerns just about that fence makeup anyways, um, especially um, as you could see it from, from Lake Street. I'm wondering if you gave any thought to different kind of, of fencing. Uh, so a couple of things in relation to what I have now. Um, so the property here abuts a residential district and you're only allowed a six foot with barbed wire uh, when it touches the residential. Um, so that's really why we did the, the six foot with the barbed wire here. Um, on that property, we would position uh, you know, the eight foot fence. And I had asked, you know, what was the, the difference? Can I, you know, do eight feet with some barbed wire on top or do you want a solid fence? Do you want something, you know, I, I'd be more than happy to take any suggestions or recommendations and, and do that. I definitely want it to be presentable and to look appropriate, especially from the Lake Street area. Um, so I do, I, I don't plan on doing anything really bad, you know, or you know, shoddy work there. We, we definitely want something that's nice. Okay, and then, um, and the barbed wire is something that you have to have because you're concerned about theft. You, you know, I think, 
or I think it would be better, but I don't have to have it now. Okay. Um, the eight foot fence, if they wanted just to keep it eight feet solid, if that's the recommendation, then that I'd be more than ha happy to do that. Um, I have a strong belief that locks and fences are for honest people um, and that the bad guys are going to get in no matter what they do. So. Okay, thank you so much for the clarification on that. You're welcome. So I'm curious with barbed wire fence right now, have you had anyone uh, bust into your lot and attempt uh, uh, to steal one of these uh, significantly sizable pieces of machinery? Um, you know, in the past 20 years, we have been broken into a few times. Um, I don't believe anyone's go over the top of the fence. I've had a guy drive through the fence. Um, I've had people break the windows, but I've never had anyone go over the top, <laughs> at least that I know of. Um, but no, I don't, uh, I don't think that would be that big of an issue for me. Okay. I, I, I am also curious about just some sense of how many pieces of equipment you need to be able to store in that kind of uh, northernmost piece of it. How, how many are you storing now and are you looking to grow? Um, and so you'd have more pieces or how many pieces of equipment generally are you storing? Or, and, and how many do you plan to store? You know, right now, um, you know, I don't think I'm gonna grow that significantly. So I don't think that that's the main goal here. Um, I think the main goal of moving is really to become a lot more efficient in what we do. Um, and right now I probably have, you know, I'm just guessing in the parking lot, um, on the worst day, there's probably 50, 60 pieces that are in there. But the majority of the time, my equipment is out on job sites. Um, so there's always a transition time, you know, where it's on job sites, it's in transport, either going to or from, um, and so there's, you know, outside of like a few rainy days in April, um, at the end of the winter season and before the construction season starts, um, our yard gets packed for that week. And then outside of that, if you come in July, sometimes there's only four or five pieces. Got it. And I understand your, you know, uh, purposes to really create more efficiency. I, I actually truly thought uh, your original plan for your site right now was pretty inefficient in terms of how you had to move stuff around. I, I, I always thought that was not was not a great way to do things, but I understood why you had to do it. So, um, and the last thing um, really I have is where where are customers going to park? I know you said it was your sense that they would come in with a pickup truck on the east end and that east entrance, okay, and they would just start moving up through that um, through that kind of little uh, pathway there, or would they park, because you've got spaces for some parking on the east end. Is that gonna be utilized at all, or is that, what is that? So, um, yeah, I would try and have my employees park on the west side of the building and the west side of the property. Um, and there are uh, spaces in front of the fence, which I would call, um, south of the fence on the east side, and then we will mm -hmm. also provide parking inside the fence also. So there'll be a, a more than adequate that, you know, so if you didn't have, let's say a trailer on the back of your truck, or, or you just came in an SUV, uh, there's gonna be probably eight to 10 parking spaces just for that. So if you just wanna come in and you've seen these pieces of equipment out there and you, you wanna get some information about that, that's where those people would park in that east parking lot. Correct. But if you but if you were either a returning ongoing customer and you knew you wanted to come in and get you would come in through that east but you would proceed immediately uh, into that path into that um, where the storage area is what did you call it? a ready the kind so of ready, ready to rent line so ready yeah, to between, rent line they'd move in there okay correct uh, between the two uh, you know if I had one on the east side and the west side you know there's it, it's a pretty wide property there towards the back of the building so I really feel like not only can we accept a couple of customers with trucks and trailers at the time, uh, but also provide a path for them to leave. You know, so I don't see that to be an issue. Yeah, that's a great way. Okay. Other questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Uditsky and then Commissioner Hoffman. Uh, yeah, Mr. Sloan, um, uh, I apologize if you addressed this already, but how does the this property compare to your existing property in terms of size? 
and then not just the property, but the building as well. And then a follow on question to that is at the current building, do you store equipment inside? Uh, and would you be doing that at this building as well? Um, so the current property that I have is just roughly over 20,000 square feet. Uh, this piece of property is about 52,000 square feet. Um, so it, it's a little bit more than double. Um, and then the, one of the problems I have with this property is about half of the property that I have is kind of in front of the building. Um, and so I can't use it for storage. I can't use it. You know, it's kind of an operating area for us during the day for customers to load and unload um, people trying to pull in. And then, you know, next thing you know, you got the mail truck coming in and uh, it's not very efficient. So um, the, the property itself is about two, two and a half times bigger. Um, my current building is 4,400 square feet. The current building there is 5,000. And then we're talking about putting a 1,500 square foot addition on. So that'll bring the building up to 6,500. Um, we do park equipment inside the building. Um, anything small that, you know, what I would deem to be small is definitely kept inside. Like if you had a, a generator or a, maybe a sod cutter or a power washer that you used on the weekends, um, all those type of items would be kept inside the building at night. Really what we keep outside is just the larger stuff and the buckets and stuff like that, that, you know, you, could, you can't really steal or, you know, put over a fence or something like that. Um, Thank you. Yes. Commissioner Hoffman. Thanks, Chair Rose. Uh, Mr. Sloan, just a, a couple of questions and then you know, maybe um, a point of clarification for, for city staff. So looking at your um, site plan circulation diagram A, um, so that's what you can do on the site now um, without essentially the conditional use, if I understand this correctly. Um, it looks to me as if the fence line for this particular um, circulation plan is significantly pulled up closer to Lake Street. Is that correct? I think we did do that a little bit to maximize the storage space um, as well as to allow for that traffic flow that would go around the building and could return back to Lake Street. Sure. Um, so, so it, yes. lo yeah, it looks to me as if it's you know, roughly 25 to 30 feet off of, um, you know, uh, lake um, plus or minus. Um, and on diagram B, you're, you're, you're at least double that. So I guess, I guess my point is, um, I think diagram B is more attractive from a Lake Street perspective because you're pulling the fence line back. It's just a point of an opinion, you know. Um, and, and then I guess questions regarding circulation. Um, so in diagram A, essentially all of your available parking with the exception of I think three spaces is, is what I'll call in your circulation lot, your storage area. So now you're starting to mix all of your customer traffic, whether it be the, the, the person as Chair Rose mentioned, who's just kind of pulling in for information, as well as those who are pulling in to you know, grab a piece of equipment and pull out. I guess I'm just suggesting that diagram A, you're, you're introducing some safety issues, I think, with that particular plan because you're mixing all of the traffic, um, you know, behind your, 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 your fenced off area. So again, just a, a point of, of uh, clarification and opinion. Um, are you unable to do the one story addition um, off of diagram A? Yeah, so if, you know, if we had to utilize that area in the back for storage and maximize, if we weren't allowed to do the 20 feet, then yeah, I do not believe we would be able to, to build the addition in this scenario because I don't, I think we would lose too much, um, you know, with the, with the traffic returning back to Lake Street, I don't think it would flow very well and we wouldn't be able to put that addition on. So I probably wouldn't do the addition in that situation um, okay. if I did, you know, continue to, to you know, to purchase the property. Um, and just as a clarification, you know, I think that maybe uh, the drawing is a little bit misleading, but um, where it shows parking spots 14 and 15, uh, there would be additional parking that would be in that red area, uh, which would be just north of the fence. So inside the fence in the area, because there would be a walk, through, walk in there for a doorway too. 
as you and can that, see. That's referencing there. diagram B that you just mentioned. Yeah, diagram B, yeah. And you can okay. see that it shows uh, for office entry right there. So we would not park equipment in front of the door there. That's, I, I think that was just drawn not as good as I would like it. Sure. And then just, I guess, another comment regarding safety. I mean, I, I, I do like what you've mentioned regarding the traffic out of your circulation lot onto Fisher Farm versus back out onto Lake so that they can use the signalized intersection either to the east or west. Um, and then I guess one point of clarification or question for city staff. Um, so we're asking for an eight foot solid fence. Um, and being a newbie to the commission, I guess, you know, I need some, some information from you guys on this. We're requiring an eight foot solid fence, but then we're saying you need to park 20 feet from the fence line. Um, someone help me with that. I can. Um, so yes, when you have um, outdoor storage, it is supposed to be screened by an eight foot solid fence. The ordinance didn't contemplate a situation like this where there's a through lot. So, you know, if it's a typical lot in our industrial park, it's going to have, you know, if it's not a corner, it's only going to have a front yard or the, the street side. And then, you know, the idea is you could put your eight foot fence, you know, behind your building and along your side and rear property lines, which would which would be allowed because an eight foot fence is allowed in a side and a rear property line. The situation here has to do with it being a through lot. So technically, Fisher Farm is a front yard, um, even though it doesn't really function as the front yard for this property. So it's sort of a, a conflict in the code. So essentially extenuating circumstances with this. I mean, it's kind of, yeah. a, okay. Um, because I, it would seem to me that the the most logical place to park the equipment is next to the fence because that shields it the most as it's up against it. So, okay, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Garland. Thanks, Chair Rose. Uh, Mr. Sloan, a, a couple of questions. The, um, and maybe this is related to the new facility as well as your existing facility, but a lot of pieces of equipment and some, some um, uh, reasonably heavy pieces of, of machinery. How do you service those? Um, we do our own service. Um, so part of the addition would have um, the maintenance, you know, um, when it comes to a real heavy repair, we would then go back to like the cat dealer down the street or something like that. Um, but the majority of our stuff is, is fairly light maintenance. So we do all our own light maintenance and that would be done inside the building um, in the new addition, as well as, right. you know, part of the, the current building would be repurposed to have some overhead doors to be able to bring, you know, the smaller stuff in and out. And, and, and just, just, I guess, so that I'm clear, I mean, light repairs, uh, not heavy chemical uh, related to those repairs. Yeah, I mean, you're just really talking about oil changes and air filters and, you know, uh, fixing a flat tire, or, you know, washing, stuff like that. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, any, any change or sense on what you'd be doing with the signage and maybe you addressed that and I just didn't, I didn't pick that up. Um, so there is a uh, pylon sign in front of the building. Uh, we would re, uh, right. use the, the exact same sign. We would just change the plastic sheet in there. Um, I was looking at potentially adding some signage to the front of the building. Um, we haven't got the exact measurements on the sign, but I believe that the code, the, I, I can't remember if it's like 5% of the frontage or um, the rules. I believe we have some extra room there. So I thought that any additional signage, we would not have to go in for a request uh, that it would fall within the, uh, the allotted space. Right, and, 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 then, and then for security purposes, uh, I'm assuming that you're looking at some sort of lighting package for off hours. And so what, what are your thoughts there? Um, the parking lot's currently very well lit currently. Um, and so we would just utilize the, uh, the current lighting situation. I, I haven't, you know, I guess once I move in, I, you know, you might see something different, but I think right now there's more than adequate outdoor uh, lighting at night currently. And, and I guess one last question, the, the back sites, I thought Commissioner Snyder brought up a really good uh, point is, is machinery is 
is parked and displayed out front and how that may or may not affect some sight lines. And so similarly to the back is we've got an eight, an eight foot fence that will extend across the back there um, and, and heavy equipment that's going to be coming out uh, trucks loaded with equipment. And so, uh, and maybe this is part city staff, but I mean, any issues with the sight lines or, or safety, safety issues relative to the egress there. So if, uh, you know, there is a, a pretty good sized grass buffer there off of Fisher Farm Road on one of the drawings that uh, uh, I gave into the package as you can see from the aerial view. Um, and I would follow the existing fence line that the neighbor has. Right. So uh, I believe that you would, once you entered or left the gate, the gate would be on the inside of that. Um, and once you got through the gate, you would have a significant amount of grass and, and there's no bushes or anything currently at the moment. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Burns. Thank you, Chair Rose. Mr. Sloan, uh, just a few other questions. Um, so the property on Route 83 right now, which I've been by many times, uh, I can see you're very crowded there. Uh, what's going to become of that property? Uh, I don't have any use for it as of right now. Uh, it would either be probably just listed for sale. Okay. And then in terms of parking, uh, if I could ask uh, Eileen this question, uh, it looks like this would fall into parking class eight, perhaps, because eight has a category for business machine sales and services. And that would result in a requirement of three spaces per thousand square feet. So they'd need 19 spaces. Otherwise, class 29, but that would be two spaces per employee. And I don't know how many employees he's going to have. Uh, so currently I have 10 employees um, and we are currently on this drawing providing 20 spots. So that would uh, qualify for both of those. Okay, I guess it would work either way. Okay, that's all I have. And that is what I recall when I reviewed the parking that either parking classification would be met. Any other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Snyder. Yes, this is a question for Eileen. Um, is a chain link fence with slats, does that count as a solid fence? Yes, that would. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to ask uh, Eileen, um, let me ask Mike first. Is there anyone in the public comment room who wishes, from the public who wishes to give testimony? No, there's not. All right, Eileen, can you please let us know if there's anyone in the public who's indicated a desire to give public testimony either on the phone um, or through email? So there are no emails and I think Emily is checking my voicemail. All right, so, so bear with us for about 30 seconds. Chair Rose, there are no voicemails. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We will now then close the public hearing uh, on this particular case. It has been our um, practice that unless um, a commissioner objects that we would move towards deliberation this evening, uh, would that uh is that acceptable to you, Mr. Sloan? Yes, that would be great. Okay. So let's ask, is there any commissioner who wishes, uh, who objects uh, to doing, to deliberating this case this evening? Seeing none. All right. Then let me ask for a motion uh, to deliberate. Do we need a motion to deliberate? Let's just go, I, yeah, we're gonna, in the service of efficiency, 
Let's move just for a, can we get a motion uh, to approve the conditional use as presented to us? A motion and a second to approve the conditional use. Commissioner Hoffman moves, and is there a second? Commissioner Uditsky. Okay. And Commissioner Pittman gives a, th a third. Very good. So, all right. Uh, Commissioner Hoffman, let me hand it to you to lead the discussion and the deliberation on this particular case, which is for a conditional use. Thank you, Chair Rose. So, um, as you're all well aware, there, there are seven standards for review um, for a conditional use permit. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on each of these. Many of uh, them have been covered in the back and forth dialogue already, but I'll summarize them. Um, the first is the establishment, maintenance, or operation of the conditional use will not be detrimental to or endanger public health, safety, morals, comfort, or general welfare. Uh, I think we we have addressed that. Um, it's a, a property that's been vacant now for over a year. Uh, I think what uh, Mr. Sloan is uh, suggesting in terms of uh, repurposing uh, this particular property um, makes sense. Um, the second being that the conditional use will not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of other property in the immediate vicinity for the purposes already permitted nor substantially diminish and impair property values within the neighborhood. Uh, again, we address this. Uh, I appreciate, as I, I'm sure the rest of the commission does, that Mr. Sloan did reach out to neighbors in the area uh, to give them an idea of what he was planning. Uh, and essentially, um, uh, from, from what we've heard tonight, um, received uh, what seemed to be uh, positive responses regarding that. Um, three, the establishment of the conditional use will not impede the normal and orderly development and improvement of the surrounding property for the permitted uses in the district. Uh, again, we address that in the back and forth and it does not. Um, that adequate utilities, access road drainage and or necessary facilities have been or are being provided. Um, uh, essentially, he's utilizing what is already in place um, and, and what are being provided. Um, and one can argue making um, uh, a, a good use of the fact that this is uh, a lot that has that, um, as I think Eileen put it, um, that, you know, kind of through traffic. Six, that the proposed conditional use is not contrary to the objectives of the current comprehensive plan uh, for the city. Um, that also was mentioned during uh, the back and forth. Uh, this essentially falls in line with um, the comprehensive plan for the city and that sub area um, and is in line with, uh, with, with that. Uh, and then lastly, that the conditional use shall in all other respects conform to the applicable regulations of the district in which it's located, except as such regulations may in each instance be modified pursuant to the recommendations of this commission. Um, and uh, yes, um, that it does conform with the applicable regulations uh, within this district. So uh, based on that, I, I would be in favor of granting this conditional use. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Commissioner Hoffman. Commissioner Uditsky. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Rose. So uh, when I initially looked at uh, this, um, it first struck me that it wasn't appropriate to have outdoor storage for equipment, you know, and whatnot, and, uh, you know, have the, the lot fenced in and, and all, but as, um, I mean, I, I live up that way. And as I travel back and forth and really looked in and around the area, um, I do actually think that it's appropriate. Frankly, if you look up and down Lake street with all of the outdoor, storage with the car dealers, right? Um, you know, there's cars parked outside, you know, all over the place up there. Um, next door has a fence with a, you know, like a, what is that, a motorized gate, right? That comes in and out. Doesn't necessarily have outdoor storage, but the entire area, you know, is fenced off with a chain link uh, fence. Um, so when I started to look at it, I really, you know, found that it was uh, appropriate uh, for 
uh, for the area. I also think that the way that um, they're setting up with the through flow of the traffic makes a lot of sense um, here because um, uh, customers can come through with their trailers or their pickups, whatever it is, pick up what they need and then, you know, go right through to, you know, to the other, um, the other side. Uh, of the property and, and exit uh, easily as well. I'm not really concerned about the storage of the equipment out front like he was talking about. Um, you know, I think pointing out the patent, you know, dealership that was down the street at the corner uh, of, um, what is that, Grand and, you know, and Lake Street had been there for years and I really didn't see any, you know, issue uh, with that. Certainly we don't want, you know, something where there's, you know, snow blowers and you know and a and hundred pieces of equipment out there right but you know if there's a backhoe and a, a you know whatever other piece of equipment right i don't know all the names but you know if you have three pieces out there that he's using for you know display purposes uh, i think that's fine especially again given that you look right across the street and you have a hundred cars you know parked out at the at the dealership there so um, all in all, I think it's a, a good solid plan, a good use for that property. I think it's consistent with um, the businesses that are on Lake Street uh, and would be a, a good solid addition to, um, to that corridor. Thank you. Commissioner Pittman, did you have a comment you wanted to make? Sure. Um, I, I just, I guess I wanted to just say that um, I agree with what uh, Commissioner Hoffman and Commissioner Uditsky said. Um, I, I definitely support this. I think it fits in well. Um, my only comment would be that I, I would like to see um, a better fence at the Lake Street side. Um, you know, I, I, I don't care as much about the other elevations because they're just not seen um, in terms of when you're on Lake Street, you're really not going to see those elevations. But I do think that even though there is a chain link fence um, with the one neighbor, um, that is just a four foot one. And when you're talking about eight feet, um, double that size, I definitely think something more presentable is appropriate on Lake Street. Um, and it's not a huge area of fencing either. So it seems to be um, something that should be able to be accommodated. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Garland. Thanks, Chair Rose. Uh, there, there were a couple comments that were made that I just kind of like to reinforce and tie back, but Commissioner Hoffman's earlier comments regarding the storage up against the fence, I just think that that makes the, the most sense, you know, particularly given the type of use here and, and the significantly enhanced ingress and egress. Um, uh, options that are laid out, particularly with diagram B. Uh, the, you know, the one thing, if we go back to kind of the sub area work that was done and on the Lake Street corridor, uh, and while, you know, we, we didn't necessarily anchor into really specific ideas on enhancements in that Lake Street corridor, we did talk about the need for those enhancements. And to uh, Commissioner Pittman's point, I don't believe that a chain link fence lends itself to a significant enhancement along that corridor and something, particularly an eight foot fence. And I know that there are chain link fences uh, along there, but we, we need to start as, as part of this, you know, I think anchoring into what we, what we did talk about and agree to in terms of some of those potential enhancements. And I think, I think um, specifying, you know, something other than a chain link fence without barbed wire is an important um, element to the, at least the Lake Street side um, part of this development. I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Commissioner Garland and Commissioner Pittman on that, uh, the fence as it, um, a chain, an eight foot chain link fence. And the, and the good news is it sounds like um, Mr. Sloan is willing uh, certainly on that Lake Street side um, to uh, have a different type of fence other than chain link. And that's, I, I would, I would certainly uh, uh, concur with that, that that makes some sense. Commissioner McCoyd. 
Thank you, Chair Rose. When we're talking about the type of fence, what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about a solid wood fence? Are we talking about a fence like it's around uh, Elmhurst College's football field? Uh, I mean, what, what type of a fence are we talking about? Or can we um, indicate what type of fence we want there? What type of fence the city wants there? Is that, I don't know, maybe I can ask Eileen that. Can you specify what exact type fence you want there? So you could certainly add a condition for the fence along the Lake Street side or the entire property because it's a conditional use. You can you can add a condition about the specific type of fence. Okay, thank you. So this is one of those few times where actually the the commission can suggest something from an aesthetic point of view. Normally, that it's not something we really do, but uh, it is a conditional use. So there ha there are a lot of examples of that. Uh, for example, when uh, Chase Bank long ago moved into Elmhurst on York, um, the commission actually dictated the color and the type of brick uh, that they needed to use on that facility. And you remember, may remember that, Commissioner McCoy, that that was. So we do have that ability to uh, really make that a, a condition. So I'd be interested to hear from Mr. Sloan what his thinking is on that. If, if you didn't do a, a chain link fence, uh, what would your thinking be on that? Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, I think the biggest reason that I put a solid chain link, eight foot chain link fence is because it was clearly written in the code and I was trying to uh, follow the rules as much as possible and um, give the least ask as I could with any uh, questions that I had. So uh, I'm very flexible, uh, you know, I'm from Elmhurst, as I said, uh, you know, I've been in this current property for a long time. I plan on being in that one longer. Um, so I definitely want it to look appropriate. I want it to look nice. Um, and, you know, sometimes the wood fences, I don't necessarily like specifically because they don't seem to last very long. Um, and then they can tend to be a little bit shoddy. Um, but I think that, you know, if I talk to the fence guy, I can come up with an appropriate fence that uh, I think would look very, um, appealing from Lake Street, and I don't have any problem with that. Um, as well as even if we could possibly, you know, do something else in front of there just to make it look a little bit better. But uh, I certainly would uh, be more than happy to, to work with the city and find something that's appropriate. I think that makes sense. Uh, as long as it's not a white plastic fence, you, you'll have my support. <laughs> Commissioner, you did, Commissioner Udinsky. Yeah, I think if you um, actually drive up and down Lake Street, you'll see, you know, some precedent for this. Um, I mean, obviously we're here and we can't all be out there right now, but if you go on, you know, the Google, right, you'll see number one, um, most of the auto dealers do have, um, they're obviously set up a little bit differently, but you know, they have the cars out front and then on the sides, they have, primarily chain link fences, one's painted black, you know, one's, you know, standard with the gate and everything where it's, um, you know, you, you can drive through. But then if you go all the way down uh, Lake Street near Grand, um, there's that international auto body place and it's a chain link fence and it has uh, like the slats uh, in it. I'm not necessarily saying that that's what we should do, but you know, that'll give you an example of, um, and it's uh, almost an exact situation as here where the fence, you know, kind of starts at the corner, you know, of the building, right? And then goes to the property line as a gate, an automatic gate that comes in. But if you, uh, if you look at that, it'll give you an idea of what, you know, this in theory could look like. Uh, let me suggest that one of the ways that we can move this forward is that we make a condition that it, it not be uh, it, what I'm going to call a raw chain link fence of eight feet and that the uh, applicant work with uh, city staff uh, to identify uh, something that is more aesthetically pleasing. I really resonate with what Commissioner Garland said about that. Uh, Lake Street corridor really doing something to spruce that up. So um, that would be my preference is that we make it as a condition that it not be a chain link, a, a raw chain link fence and that the petitioner work with city staff to uh, develop another one. It, it, that would be the suggestion I'd have. Any comments on that or 
Commissioner Snyder. Yes, I, I wholeheartedly agree about the chain link fence. And one of my concerns with the, the slats that are often used is that there tends to be a translucent quality to some of those slats. And of course, there's always little gaps in between the slats and, and the actual metal chain links themselves. So I would prefer to see a fence that is truly solid and um, not six feet with two feet of barbed wire, um, you know, a, a truly solid eight foot non-translucent fence, um, particularly on that Lake Street side, as everyone else had had mentioned. And, you know, I would also think about that along the Fisher Farm Road, because that is frontage that, you know, is a through lot that is technically also the front of the property. And there are other businesses along there that are treat that road as frontage. Um, so, and that's a much smaller because the, the property really tapers down. You just might want to consider that for that side as well. But I think it is particularly important for Lake Street. Um, you know, a lot of residents, I live up on the north side as well. A lot of people are relieved that the, um, the cat dealership is leaving because that's been an eyesore looking at all of that heavy equipment out there and they're thrilled that a business park is coming in. Um, so at any rate, I would just really encourage you to work with city staff on that as well to make it truly a solid fence so that no equipment is visible in any kind of given light conditions um, through that fence. So that's all, thank you. I'm gonna ask um, a commissioner to uh, really suggest an amendment uh, as a condition to be placed onto this. Um, and then we can, um, we would vote on that specific amendment. Is that correct, uh, Eileen? So I believe that the, um original commissioners who made the motion in the second can go back and amend the motion in the second. So I would ask if one of those uh, two, Commissioner Hoffman or Commissioner Uditsky, if they would be willing to do that. Uh, I'm fine with that, yes. It's Commissioner Hoffman. Um, so essentially uh, amending the conditional use to reflect that the applicant will work with city staff on coming up with a fencing solution for the portion of the property that faces Lake as well as Fisher Farm Road. Let me ask if the uh, Commissioner Udiski, who was the second on that, if that is amendment uh, that he'd be willing to accept? Yes. Okay. Chair Rose, can I get a clarification? Can we, can yes. we specify that it cannot be a chain link fence? That was my commission specify. I know I said work with the city staff, but clarification for us is that it cannot be chain link. Is that correct? That's my understanding of the intent of the commission. And let me, I'll ask both the uh, uh, first uh, Commissioner Hoffman who made the first and Commissioner Uditsky who seconded if that was their intent. Uh, yes, that's, that's the intent uh, that the amended conditional use would require the applicant to work with city staff um, on the section of fencing facing Lake and Fisher Farm um, and the material that would be used to support that would not be chain link and would be some other type of, uh, uh, of fencing. Commissioner Uditsky. Oh, You're muted. Sorry about that, yeah. Uh, honestly, I mean, I'm okay if it's chain link, just not raw to use your term chair rows. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Where to go. Clarification: The code does not law allow raw fence. It's got to be a solid fence. So it can't just be a raw chain link fence. Anyways, the code would not allow that. I thought that Eileen just mentioned that a chain link fence is considered a solid fence. With the slats in it, it is. With the slats in it. Okay. Okay. So we. It, what we're saying is we don't have to add this. Is that what you're saying, Mike? 
Well, I'm just saying that if you don't want to be chain link, if a chain link fence with a slats and there's okay, then it doesn't have to change. But the discussion I'm hearing, some of it was that we don't want a chain link fence on either Fisher Farm or Lake. If that's truly what the, the desire of the commission is, I just want to make sure it's clarified that that's what it is. So, so when staff works with them, we know that if he comes and wants a chain link fence with slats, we can say, no, that's not one of the options that the commission wanted. Let me ask commissioners what your thinking is on this. So if I understand this correctly, um, Mike, essentially we have to state that it can't be chain link because we can't clear, use the qualifier chain link um, or raw chain link, I, I guess is, is the point I'm trying to make. Because that's already illegal. That is already not yeah. allowed. Commissioner Burns and then Commissioner Snyder. Thank you. Um, yeah, my own feeling would be uh, since this came up primarily, I believe from Commissioner Garland with respect to the Wake Street frontage, that uh, my feeling would be that uh, if the east-west extent of fence going from the west side of the building to the west property line facing Lake Street were a wood solid wood fence or some other solid fence that was not chain link. Uh, I think that would be appropriate. As far as the fences going up and down uh, the west property line and the east property line and then back at Fisher Farm Road, uh, I would be fine with chain link fence with slats. That's my feeling. Commissioner Snyder, you had a comment? Yes, I, I actually agree with C Commissioner Burns on his assessment of that as well. I think the frontage, uh, the fence facing Lake Street should not be chain link with slats at all. Um, that should be another solid uh, non-translucent material. So I don't think the slats in a chain link fence really allow full, um, you know, um, coverage in terms of uh, hiding the, the equipment that'll be stored back there. So I think for Lake Street, that's important. So I agree with Commissioner Burns that that's the way it should be read. So to clarify then, Mike, what we're saying is uh, the a condition of this is no chain link fence on the, on the front of the property. Okay. Okay. Can I ask one right. more clarification? Sure. There was some discussion about storing the equipment out in front. Uh, if this condition use gets approved just as it is right now, he can store out there 24 seven. Is that the intent? I know uh, Mr. Sloan mentioned it was only during his business hours. If that's truly what we want to be or limit what it can be out there, then that should be a condition also. So we have to specify that it would be <clears throat> three vehicles and only during business hours. Is that you correct? Want limit? Yes. Uh, before I do that, I want to ask Mr. Sloan, currently what you do is you do, I know you said you do several of them, and it was, is it only during business hours that you have them out there? Yes, <clears throat> we definitely, I, I would not leave any equipment out there overnight or when we were not there. I would definitely bring everything inside the fence, no matter what. Um, and I don't have any problem with the condition of, you know, just during business hours, that would not be a problem. Um, you know, if, if okay. you wanted to limit it to business hours, that would be appropriate. Okay, I'm going to suggest then the amendment be that it be uh, it's a that it be three uh, vehicles. Three, I, I keep calling them vehicles. Three pieces of machinery uh, can be placed out there uh, only during business hours. That would be the other conditional piece of that. So can, uh, I'll ask if Commissioner Hoffman and Commissioner Udiski are willing to accept that in your motion. Uh, this is Commissioner Hoffman. Yes, um, we'll, we'll accept those conditions. Commissioner yes, Udiski? Yes, that's acceptable. Sure. Okay. So that is what we will be voting on, is that? Are there any other... Questions? All right. I'm going to ask Eileen then 
to uh, call the roll and, and, and the, what we are voting on is that we would approve, we would recommend the conditional use with two conditions. One is that the fence in the front uh, of the property, which is on the south side of the, the south elevation of the property, that that be non-chain link uh, fence. And the se second condition is that there be uh, a maximum of three vehicles or three pieces of machinery that are placed out in front of the uh, building uh, and only during business hours. Those are the two conditions that would be placed uh, on this. So that would be part of the vote. So if you disagreed with any one of those two conditions or you disagreed generally <clears throat> on the conditional use, you would vote no. Okay, Eileen, will you call the roll? Thank you. Commissioner Hoffman. Yes. Commissioner Ruditsky. Yes. Commissioner Burns. Yes. Commissioner Garland. Yes. Commissioner McCoy. Yes. Commissioner Pittman. Yes. Commissioner Snyder. Yes. Chair Rose. Yes. Great, we'll send that recommendation. and. I I'm sorry I didn't say this earlier because I wanted to make sure that uh, my words go up to the Development Planning and Zoning Committee that part of the reason why I'm absolutely in support of this is because uh, I remember Mr. Sloan and this very business faced incredible obstacles with a lot of neighbors and they were very different conditions that were that in terms of time and when they could move it's just a variety of things and um, this is a business that took all of those very seriously and really has um, remained a very good neighbor with neighbors who were pretty opposed to this a number of years ago. So I really want to applaud him for that and that that's, ex it's my expectation. That's exactly what we're going to see with this one. So thank you. So, thank so you. the next, the next one, it will go up to the development planning and zoning committee. And that will be when? That will most likely be Monday. I'll confirm that with the applicant tomorrow. And um, before I forget, Kiki, would we be able to have these transcripts expedited, please, for this particular case? No problem. Great. Thank you. Good luck, Mr. Sco Sloan. I think it's going to be great. Thank you very much, and I appreciate everyone's time tonight. All right. Great. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Moving on, let me ask, Emily, is Mr. Lopez here? Yes, Carol, okay. yes, Mr. Lopez. All right. We will then move into case number um, 23 ZBA02, and I'm gonna ask you to introduce this case to us. All right, excellent. This is case 21 ZBA02. Uh, the request is for a variation from the front yard requirement from 25.16 feet to 19.69 feet. Uh, the application was filed on March 2nd, 2021. The date of the legal notice of public hearing was March 18th, 2021. The legal notice uh, sign was posted March 19th, 2021. The first class mailing of notice was March 22nd, 2021. And tonight is the public hearing, April 7th, 2021. And we do have Ruben Lopez, the applicant, uh, the father of the property owner. And uh, he has been sworn in already tonight. And I will let you sit either here or here if you'd like to get a little bit more uh, within the view. Okay, very good. Okay, great. So he has been sworn in, excellent. Yeah. So Mr. Lopez, give us an idea why you need a variation. Uh, just so you know, it's always our practice that we go and look at the property. I was just by that property several days ago and had a chance to look at it and everyone else does as well. So give us your uh, sense of why this variation is needed and what happened. Well, for my understanding, um, I should have heard a I believe was the columns, the only issue on this case because I um, was requesting for angle uh, to hold the front middle roof 
the shadow on top of the deck um, and was to put, to, you know, they wanted to put it like at an angle and I put it straight up for the structure uh, secured instead of an angle. Um, and that was what I talked to the one of the gentlemen here in the structure um, inspectors. They told me if you put it in an angle, everything done, everything is okay. But so now it's, I heard it's uh, something with the easement on uh, 19 to 25, whatever it is, but I, I wasn't, I didn't know, I didn't know on that part. However, if it that same thing, um, I was, uh, I was expecting just to have something about the, with the columns uh, to be approved um, as to be a straight or to be in an angle. Other than that, um, I mean, because the, the same landing and everything is exactly what it was the old one, except that I put a straight columns for secure as well, because when I leveled the house over there, the roof, that one was already sagged like a six inches. And normally when you put those, I've been building for 26 years. And when you put those angle, eventually, sometimes they start settle. Uh, regardless, sometimes you put a different thing onto the structure, but it's not really solid sitting on something. And with the snow and everything, uh, the, the wind and everything, those uh, little overhang roofs are always tend to be pressure down. So if uh, I believe if uh, I, as, as a matter of fact, would it cost me a little more to do it this way than, than do it in an angle, it's cheaper. But to me, the structure part of the building, when I build, I like to be solid and consistent. So for many years after I finish, okay. that's the reason I request if I can have it. And I mean, actually I put him, I put him on straight up. Okay. My understanding, and let me just make sure, I want to clarify this for the commission, that uh, when the plans were approved, it was to be angled or a bracket. And when that happened, uh, those stairs were not considered uh, in the setback. But as soon as those, it became columns instead of an angled piece, the stairs then had to be included. And that's where that six feet comes in. So in essence, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Eileen, but in essence, um, it, it really, it's an oddity of our code. I, I, I understand this, but that that's really, it kicked in a different part of the code. As soon as those columns were put in, now it was an overhang and we had to count those stairs in it. Is that correct, Eileen? That, that pretty much sums it in up. In essence. It's, yeah. Okay. All right. So. You're, you are muted, Jeros. Saw that, yes. Is there anyone in the public comment room who wishes to give testimony on this case? No, there is not. Uh, Eileen, uh, is there anyone through your uh, voicemail or uh, email rather who has said they wish to give public uh, testimony on this? Uh, no emails. Okay. And Emily, you will check, you're checking the voicemail? I think she is. There, there are no voicemails, Chiros. All right. So what that means is there's no public, no comment, public testimony from that. Um, so let me ask uh, questions from the commission. Commissioners have questions on this uh, case. Or comments, questions, comments? Seeing none, um, we will move into deliberation on this case. Um, uh, no, first let me close the public hearing. Public hearing is closed. Uh, so we will move into deliberation and I will, We. this is a request for a variance and I will um, ask for a motion and a second to approve the request, uh, to recommend the request for a variance. Commissioner Garland moves, Commissioner Snyder seconds. Commissioner Garland. Thanks, Chair Rose. 
Uh, I this is pretty straightforward from from my perspective. I think that you know you had, you mentioned it, Chair Rose. There's there's an oddity in the code here. I mean, the only thing that's different here um, is that we've got columns instead of some sort of angled bracket that attaches the, that that uh, cover. Uh, over the porch to the to the house, and so I think that that in and of itself, I mean, nothing else really has changed. You you still have the stairs, you still have the the overhang from uh, over the over the door. The support mechanism has changed from an angle to being straight down on on the patio, and would would agree that it's probably a more stable stable structure as a result. And I think that due to the oddity, bit of the oddity in the code, and none of the other dimensions or variables within you know, this proposal had changed um, that um, there's a unique circumstance there in, in and of itself as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I think that as we go on to the second variation that it, it will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Uh, I, I don't think that it would alter it at all. I, I think that the columns probably enhance it a bit versus having something angled there and so support that as well. And I think that the the last one, the last one for me, I, I think it's it's a bit irrelevant. And I would still, on by virtue of the other two variation standards, would support the request. Thank you, Commissioner Snyder. Yes, I agree with everything that uh, Commissioner Garland um, has stated. Uh, you know, and I, I can't imagine that adding a columns would would do anything other than enhance the essential character of the neighborhood, considering that another a number of other homes have these overhangs with columns in, in that neighborhood. And, and the fact that the columns will provide more structural support, I really do think that speaks to um, standard number three about a reasonable return or, or, or enjoyment. It's going to increase the longevity of that overhang and um, just be more stable overall. So it, you know, as was mentioned, this is just an oddity of the code and nothing else has changed. So I absolutely think this is a, a, something that needs to be approved. Thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? Okay. Um, we did have one um, comment from the public. Uh, someone wrote in, and and I suppose we could say petitioner probably should have known about this uh, when he made that change that it was going to be different. But I I don't know. I I think that's uh, that seems in my mind to be stretching it. Um, I think that this is not unreasonable, and I would totally support this. So, any other comments or? All right, Eileen, I'm going to ask you to call the roll. Thank you. Commissioner Garland. Yes. Commissioner Snyder. Yes. Commissioner Burns. Yes. Commissioner Hoffman. Yes. Commissioner McCoy. Yes. Commissioner Pittman had to step away from the meeting. Commissioner Uditsky. Yes. Chair Rose. Yes. So uh, Mr. Lopez, is this going to? Yes. Uh, DPC. So, uh, Mr. Lopez, uh, what this means is that we rec we are going to issue a positive recommendation, and I hope the Development Planning and Zoning Committee will see it our way at this point. Uh, I understand, you know, the you know things look different on the ground when you start to build, it, et cetera. So, um, I, I I'm hoping that this will be. Uh, approved uh, at the zoning uh, development planning and zoning committee which should be next monday yes it will most likely be monday we'll confirm with the applicant tomorrow and then kiki could we also please have these transcripts expedited thank you so what that means is you uh, i would recommend that you come to that committee meeting as well and then once they finish their recommendation it will go to the full city council so hopefully things will work out well so all right, good luck to you. Thank you for your time. Sure. Good job. Okay. okay. The next item uh, in front of us is really a continuation of a, a public here. It's a continuation of this one, is it right, that we started several weeks ago. This is case number 21 P01. 
Um, Eileen, do you have any comments as we continue this public hearing? Uh, I do not. I don't know if Emily has any comments. I know the applicant is here this evening with um, a couple other members of his team, and I believe they have a PowerPoint that they want to present to the commission. Okay. Emily, do you have any other introductory comments you want to make? I do not, Chair Rose. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it at all. And I will go ahead and pull the PowerPoint up. Are we yeah, ready sure. For this? Okay. Sure. All right. I just want to say that we have a traffic engineer here and also yes, the architect. I'll do that. I'll do that. Yes. I'll do okay. That. Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. All right. Go ahead. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So we're here tonight to discuss the proposed project for 828 and 836 North York Street. My name is George Montesantos. I'm with GEM Building Contractors. I'm a general contractor um, hired by the owner to hopefully build this if it's approved. To my right here, we have John Sonic, the owner of the You Do It Car Wash in Yorkies. Also, we have Javier Millan here, who is our traffic expert. We have Gino Sullivan, the owner's assistant, who I believe has done a very clear, concise PowerPoint presentation, mm -hmm. which hopefully, if you have time to read it, will help and answer many questions. And finally, we have Ray Fang, our architect. So I'd like to briefly touch upon a few points as most, uh, most points are discussed pretty thoroughly in this PowerPoint. Uh, we are asking for a conditional use for our first parcel, which is the You Do It Car Wash. The conditional use uh, is a bit redundant because we are replacing like for like. So what we are asking is to knock down our present uh, eight bay dilapidated, outmoded, uh, self-serve car wash and replace it with a very contemporary, state-of-the-art, five-bay self-serve car wash. So we're improving this property with a much more modern structure with three less bays. We feel this fits in uh, very well with the North York Street corridor plan, as well as uh, feeling that the existing curb cuts are going to be lessened, minimized, as well as the ones there are going to be uh, made a little bit smaller. And this will allow for better ingress and egress of our lot. You can see with the pictures, uh, you can see the, the pictures of the You Do It Car Wash, how it relates to Yorkies and how they're somewhat conjoined in a way, uh, one next to the other. Um, so I'd like to speak uh, uh, briefly. We have uh, on the car wash, we have two variance requests. The first one is that the code requires uh, 35 reservoir space is required. And as you can see from our drawing there, we are currently showing 26 spots. Um, although the reservoir spaces usually refer to stacking or in the queue, in our use here where we have a self-serve car wash, uh, there is no queue. People do not wait in line for someone to finish washing their car for, for them to enter the, the tunnel. Uh, we have five bays that you drive through. If people pull up and see all five full, they will leave. They, they won't stay. The parking that's there, other than to suffice the code or the zoning, uh, would be non-existent for the, for the uh, car wash. You, you drive in with your car to wash it, you're not gonna park your car. So there's really no use for that parking lot other than to suffice the code. There's also in the PowerPoint um, an example of the sales and one of the reasons why we're doing this. We have sales from 2019 to 2018 that are that are plummeting down in, in, in sales. And so we want to maintain this concept. This is a niche concept. People love washing their own cars. They don't like going up the street to our gem car wash. They don't, they don't like the brushes. There are people that want to wash their own. There is always that truck that has ladders and mud from a day's work out, out in the field. So this, we feel there's a need for it. It's a niche need and it's not a very widely used need to where we can say there's a peak hour 
or anything like that. If you look at this chart that we have up here, which addresses the reservoir spaces and the stacking or the queue, you see that currently we average 1.22 cars per hour over eight bays. So that means at any time during the day, you could drive up and there's always a bay open. Now we hope to do better with our new contemporary car wash, but presently through experience, we know that people wash their cars by themselves an average of six minutes. So if each bay could do 10 cars per hour and we have five bays, theoretically at its peak, we could do 50 cars an hour and have nobody waiting in line at all. And that's unfortunately, as much as we like it will never happen. It'll never be the situation. So that's to show you this uh, discussion on the reservoir spaces. The other uh, uh, variance is the setback requirement for the rear setback. So originally we came in asking to put a shed, a free floating shed. We have since changed that to put an attached, I don't know if you wanna call it a shed, an attached uh, uh, part to the uh, existing building that we're proposing. But more importantly, the reason for the zero setback is to move the four vacuums to the rear of the property. We find presently that the vacuums that are currently there where you vacuum before you enter the self serve is very inefficient. It, it, it clogs, it causes people to go vacuum and then no one can get around it to get in. So by moving the vacuums off to the left, and there's only four, by the way, there's not any more than that. Uh, it would be a more efficient usage of the parcel as well as, as the vacuum. So a car can literally pull in, wash their car and drive out. So that would be the discussion regarding the uh, request for the variance of the car wash. Um, at this time, I'd like to go into the uh, conditional uses for, uh, for Yorkies. So in a nutshell, what we're asking for in Yorkies is that we presently have a pickup window, phone in order pickup window. We'd like to convert that window to a drive-through window. So it's important to note that we're not adding more windows, we're not moving windows, we're using the existing window and we're simply adding a monument sign and order sign. Secondly, we're asking to add to the front of our building a uh, four season room, a glass enclosed structure that's uh, more, let's say COVID friendly, if you will, something that more, has a more outdoor feel. Uh, we feel that putting the doors similar to the doors that I put on 151 Kitchen Bar, if anybody's ever been there, the open patio style doors would have an open air feel to adding space to the dining room. And finally, we'd like to extend the kitchen uh, back. And by doing this, we're moving our dry storage, moving more of the prep into the back and making the current pickup area into a much more efficient uh, drive-through area, which is not efficient as it is now. So that's the conditional use and how we speak to the seven standards of the conditional use for that. The variance request number one for the uh, Yorkies is the front and side setback. So we're asking for a front yard setback. Currently it's at 40, we're asking for 21. This is so we would be allowed to build this glass enclosed front uh, dining room. It's important to note that 21 feet is just at a little bit of an area that's a vestibule area to enter. The bulk of the building is at 28 feet. Um, we feel this is a, an aesthetic addition to an already beautiful building we feel we built the, uh, what, four years ago, I think. And uh, it will be nothing but in, just enhance its appeal to the area, the neighbors, which we received positive feedback from the condominium association across the street who has seen these plans uh, that like what we're doing and how we're fixing the car wash as well as fixing Yorkies. So the side yard setback, which we talked with uh, Mike before, um, when we built Yorkies, apparently Yorkies was our, all, always uh, encroaching on their side yard. But when we built Yorkies four years ago, we submitted a permit and we built. So I can't speak to why Yorkies is in the side yard. But what I can speak to is the fact is that the new five bay car wash we're building, we are shifting it south closer to Evergreen. And now between the two buildings, we will have 34 feet, two and a half inches. It's on your drawing in the PowerPoint, you can see 
versus presently we have about 23 feet. So we're increasing the space in between the buildings uh, quite a bit, which allows for easier flow. So that's to discuss that uh, the variance number two is the parking, right? The parking request. So according to the variance, the code requires us to have 40. We're proposing 26. So on our drawing, on one of our PowerPoint slides, you'll see 26 uh, it spots. It says 24, but tech really it's 26. We apologize for that typo there. Um, it's important to note that the front of the car wash has 17 spaces. Now I touched earlier on the fact that a car wash, or you do a car wash, realistically needs zero spaces, but we have to conform to the codes we understand. So we feel that the front 17 spaces in front of our new car wash will be shared spaces and will be used for Yorkies probably more than for the car wash. So with the 26 that we have in the 17, we're now going to be offering 43 parking spots. The next question that remains is, well, we're walking past a drive through Yes, we're walking past the drive through as is Arby's when you go to Arby's as is McDonald's up the street from us when you walk past the double tandem drive through as is Chick-fil-A when I go there to eat. So the concept of walking past the drive through is a moot point. It's, it's been done and has been done and will be done. So that's our discussion on the variance request number two and the parking requirements for number three. Um, I hope I've touched on everything briefly. I'd like to open it up to questions. I have others here that could help answer any questions you may have at this time. Okay. Thank you. So let me ask if uh, any commissioners at this point, we have some questions right now from commissioners. We want to leave that power. Are we, Which one? Which this PowerPoint, did we get that? Just a moment, hold on. On board docs. Yeah, okay, just want to make sure it's there. So, okay. Questions from commissioners. Uh, Commissioner McCoy. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I, this is maybe a strange question, but I, I noticed on the on the drawings, it says car wash and pet wash. What what does that mean? Or so, what does so, a, what does a pet wash mean? It will mostly be a dog wash. So in the front in the front of the of the car wash, there will be an area to where you can come in and wash your dog. Okay, but like if you're going to wash your dog, where are you going to park your car? You would park it in the front, so okay. one of the one of the parking spots. Uh, okay, thank you. Again, typically we we would like to do that more sort of like a convenience uh, type of uh, uh, for for more convenience for the for the customers that are washing their cars. It's not widely used, but we'd like to have a you know to have it on there since we're doing everything brand new. Okay, thank you. Sure. Is there anyone else that does that, a dog wash? I mean, can you? I think it would be the first car wash slash dog wash. In Elmer's. Around in Elmer's. Yeah. There is a dog wash across the street here, City Hall, behind Pino's Pallet. There are a few places in Elmer's presently where you can go and wash your own dog, yes. There is a dog wash behind Pino's Pallet? Yes. Right, wow. right behind Pino's Pallet on, on Bird. Is this third? Yes. Shows you I don't have a dog. dog yes. Okay. So this is a combination dog wash, car wash. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Okay. It's a common thing. Like on these on these kind of operations, it's common. You'll you'll see it, you know. Oh, right. Yeah. I don't have a dog, so I'm not I'm not up on the dog wash <laughs> technology right now. So uh Commissioner Burns. Yes, uh, for the applicant, could you please just clarify 
the in out uh, use of each um, access off of York and off of the uh, is that a right wood uh, in the after in the finished situation. In other words, the way it will be if it's approved. Right here. Uh, gotcha. Uh, we can with this. Can you guys see this slide that's up right now? Oh. Yeah. Yes. So what we're proposing is to uh, you see that uh, the uh, in on Yorkies and the out is now redirected more in line with the drive through in and out. And now we will be removing most of the uh, York Road. There's currently a very large York Road curb cut in front of the car wash. We're removing all that, putting some very nice landscaping and we're putting one enter and exit on Evergreen for the five bay car wash. You see the arrows there. And we're taking, we're taking also, on Wrightwood there's also, there's two curb cuts we're taking existing. Those out. So we're taking one of those, one of those is gonna be eliminated. Okay. So we're eliminating a great deal of curb cuts. We're realigning them and making them more efficient for the flow of this parcel. Okay, so just to follow your arrows, on your side street, you'll have both full in and out. Yes. They can go left and right, in and out. It's full access. Yes. Right, okay. Then on York, you're going to have uh, in only on the northern, uh, north of the built of Yorkies. It's only ingress. That's all it is. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, but uh, and then coming out on the south of Yorkies, where the drive-through will be, that will be only egress. Yes. Okay. Similar to McDonald's. Similar to McDonald's, we will we will make signs to show that, like McDonald's does, in and out, and so on. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you. Can uh, can you just walk me through again? the the drive through me I mean not the drive through but the car wash I, I'm a little confused about it. I see where uh, go back to the no where you were before. yes here okay so I come in with that arrow I go into one of those bays and then I can either turn left or I can turn right you can only turn right out of the bay and go with the arrow out with the Yorkies exit you cannot turn left then then what is this arrow leading out from the car it's wash to the parking lot should someone come in park wash their dog and leave it's just a, it's just a secondary way out but and uh, it's, it's off on a side street versus everybody dumping onto york road right away okay so that would not be the primary uh exit for the car wash no okay i mean someone can go straight out onto york road after they wash their car or someone can right. circle around the parking lot and exit on Evergreen if they so desire. That well, that's the part of yeah. They so they can circle around, uh, and then uh, on the east side of the um, uh, car wash bays, correct? So they would make a right, and then they would then come down and make another right, and then make a, another right, and then a left hand turn to get out. Is that what you're saying they could do? Yes, sure, yes. Okay. Wow. All right. Why would somebody do that? What would be the purpose of that? Well, no one will probably do it, but we want to, you know, give people the option of two ways out, two ways in. And that's what we're trying to do with the arrows is offer you two ways out and two ways in. Um, that seems to me the most, that's the, that's the one that is concerning to me. That seems more uh, dangerous. That seems like that has more potential for some kind of conflicts because I, I'm coming out now, I, I made my first right hand turn. I make a second right hand turn to go south. I make another right hand turn to go west. Now I'm going to cross traffic with people who are coming into it. That's right. Okay. If I may add something, uh, my name is Javier Milan. I'm a principal of KLOA. The the whole intent of the access, as you see in the plan, is to provide uh, make flexibility above anything. The main route or the main exit route is exactly what was discussed. You exit directly onto York Road. However, 
should there be something blocking that access drive, you have another opportunity to actually exit by doing those turns that you talked about. Is that going to be the preferred route? No, it's not. But it's still available and provides that flexibility that I talked, talked about early on. Uh, Commissioner Hoffman. Um, along those same lines, uh, I'm wondering if you could move to slide six in your PowerPoint presentation. It's the proposed new site plan. There you go. So, so based on what you just said, the, the inbound into Yorkies, which is the, the, the northern most drive, you'd mentioned in the discussion that the parking with the, the car wash and, and the pet wash essentially kind of services both Yorkies and the car wash. Yeah. If I turn in to that um, entry and can't find parking and, and attempt to circulate over into the car wash lot, how would I, how would I do that? I mean, I, I'm looking at a stacking diagram here that leads me to believe that there, as, as Chair Rose put it, there'd be conflicts trying to make, make that circulation around the site. Oh, uh, let me explain something in here. What you see in the stacking for your keys is exactly what you're saying. It's just a stacking diagram just to show how many vehicles could potentially stack. It doesn't mean that it's going to be like that, but it just shows you how many vehicles are going to stack. As you enter, if you're not going into the drive through you're driving north of those cars that would be stacked. You're looking for a spot. I'm going to follow your train of thought. What if I don't find any parking on that area? I keep on going, I keep on moving, turn around. You still have the width to actually turn around and bypass those cars that would be quote unquote potentially queuing there. As you turn around, you could continue. If you notice, there's the width for two cars to actually drive going eastbound. So you have the cars that are queue for the drive through and then you have the ones that are bypassing that. And then you have all that parking area. So in that, you have three different types of circulation that are occurring um, in, in those two drive aisles. Somebody potentially circulating to go to the drive through somebody potentially circulating to look for parking, and then somebody that is circulating uh, through the car wash. Is that, is that accurate? That's, that's accurate. Keep in mind the car wash, as it was shown, you know, it's, it's a very limited uh, generator of traffic. So because of that, you know, it's, uh, there's the conflict points, just like what you're alluding, you know, and it happens that many of the drive throughs you can look at uh, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, you know, Portillo's, but uh, because of the low generator, uh, we do not anticipate that being a problem. I think we're getting stuck on the four cars being shown exiting yeah. this car wash. It looks like a clog there. And I think you're seeing that, but that's just to be a kind of a diagram of a car exiting the car wash, deciding to go straight out to York or deciding to make a right. Like Javier said, there's minimal, minimal exiting off of the five bay car wash. So a car can easily go around. And if they decide to leave, or they could go to the right and use the shared parking lot. So it, it does have flow around the building. No, I, I understand your point. I, I guess I'm just a little concerned with cars attempting to make, because that, uh, and well, that can be considered a north or southbound, go north or southbound on York, and there being a queuing up that occurs both at the car wash and at the drive through. Okay, and, yeah, and, and again, that's why I mentioned the flexibility. If you looked at the outbound only access drive, that will provide two lanes out. One lane will be striped for a left turn lane. The other one will be striped for a right turn lane. So normally the left turn movement out is the most difficult one. The, the good thing you have in here is that York Road is a five lane cross section, meaning you have a center left turn lane. So it allows you to make a two part left turn. Uh, if for some reason, like you said, what if somebody's waiting to make a left and I'm exiting the, the, the drive through or I'm exiting the, uh, the car wash, what do I do? You have the flexibility of going around and going down to Wrightwood and making a left rather than concentrating everything in one exit point. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Garland and then Commissioner Pittman. Thanks, Chair Rose. Uh, and at the risk of beating this traffic flow to death, okay, <laughs> uh, I'm going to take a little different angle to it, but um, it, I, I want to kind of understand the um, kind of the drive through operations now. Okay, so the, the window, the drive through window is, is, is basically going to be built out in the place where the pickup window is at today. Is that correct? There won't actually be a new drive through window put in or anything modified in the current window that we have. The only thing that we'll, what we'll do is we'll actually put a, uh, a menu board outside to where you don't really have to call ahead to uh, okay. come and pick up food. Right now, we kind of like, you know, we kind of encourage you calling ahead. Right, right. We'll have your food ready and you can just come and pick it up to where if we do it this way, you can come in. Go to the menu board, order whatever you have to order, and then just go to the window, to the current window that we have, and pick up the food. Okay, that, that's helpful. So your your order point then is so in this schematic here, where is the order point, the the box that you order and speak into? If you want to go where it says menu, no down, then right there. So right on the uh, on the south southwest corner of the building. Okay, so you've got a preview, a menu board. You've got a preview board, a menu board there with an order order box there, where Correct. you will the take their order. order right well, so basically, you're just right. so so they will pull up then and they will pay at the window and pick up and pick up at the window. Okay, all right. So this is my question then: it is uh, are, are is the food made to order? Or is it staged in the restaurant? It's it's made for prep. Made order. So so when they come in and pay, and there's anybody in the line, you're going to have to park them. Correct. So we have those two parking stalls in front of the of the restaurant. The the, the menu that we're going to put on there is going to be a limited menu because there are some items in our menu that takes a long time, and we don't really want to put those items on there. They'll be just I, I think it will create a traffic jam and I think it, it won't be a good experience. So what we want to do is we want to make make it a very limited menu, meaning like chicken sandwiches, gyros, stuff that we can turn around really quickly. And if somebody does order something that takes a long time, what we'd like to do is we'd like to either have them in front of those two spots over there, in front of the you want to point of them, on the uh, on the east, on the east uh, yeah. On the east east side, yeah. east side of uh, yeah. of the building of Yorkies, and we can just have them there, pull up, you know, and we'll bring it to them. And also, there's plenty of room. So we're we're proposing a, a, a something like Culvers involved in the Culvers, where we're proposing four uh, wait for your food slots, two in the front, like John said, on York Road, and then there's plenty of room between the window and the front of the building the two cars can stack or wait for food very easily. And the car, if you get the food immediately, can go around them, much like if you go to Portillo's, you'll know what I mean. You pull up, pull up, and so on. Yeah, so it's not your intent then to park those cars over on the on the southeast corner in, the, in what I guess would be the car wash lot. No. No, no I mean, no. when I when I spoke last time, that was in worst case scenario. Like, you know, like if you came in and you ordered a, something that takes a long time, right? Like a pork chop dinner, that usually takes about 10 minutes. So on the menu board, we're not gonna do that. And we're really gonna put things that are really quick and faster, faster for us to make. Okay. Just a suggestion, having experience with drive throughs a lot of it, okay, is that you move your order point back and you create a, 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 long, a, a bigger stack, stacking area for people to pay. So- yes, uh, um, yeah. I've heard that, yeah. That's so, what McDonald's uh, is doing at all the sites where they have two windows. They have a pay window and then they also have a pickup window. I'm I'm aware of that. So yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the uh, and just to confirm then, so if they pull out in front of your of, of what you're proposing to be your new addition and they park there, they've got to get back in and circle the building again Correct. and find yeah. their way out. Yes. Yes. 
But like I said, that would be minimum, very minimal use. Most of them, the way that we do it right now, if somebody does come in and order something to where they don't call ahead, what we do is, and they order something that takes a long time, what we do is we pull them up and we make them wait in front of the bill, you know, uh, after the drive through. So they'll, they'll pull up 10, 15 feet uh, in front of the drive through, and then they'll wait there and then we'll just run it to them. So when they pull out of the drive through and then hit the egress point at York Road, they can make a, a, either a right or a left turn. Is that correct? That's correct. Correct, yes. Okay, so in the event that you have something that's a raging success here, okay, and, and we all hope the businesses are raging successes, um, you've got people trying to get out onto York Road there and make a left turn on what can be a pretty busy street, yeah. right? That's correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's all I have for now. Yeah. Okay, Commissioner Pittman. Thank you, Chair Rose. Um, I guess mine are, mine are just going to be comments based on what some of the commissioners have said and based on what I understood to be the situation from the last presentation and from this presentation. And that's just, I have serious concerns about the way that the traffic is moving through these two sites. I think we have two very different separate uses that are sort of overlapping at times and sort of not, and we're borrowing parking at times, but only in worst case scenarios. And we're trying, there seems to be an attempt to, to solve some of these potential parking or some of these potential issues if they're stacking on both sides of the car wash and um, Yorkies. But I think that alone creates its own separate mess. If that was to occur, you've just got people trying to pass other sections that are gonna create a whole nother mess of issues. I just, I, I hear what the traffic consultant is saying. I hear what Yorkies is saying, um, but I, I, it's not, I guess it's not satisfying my concerns. Um, I think that the, the traffic is going to increase because of the new um, more efficient drive-through. I mean, that's the point of putting it in so that you can service more people. Um, the stacking of, some of those people in front of the restaurant um, who have to wait longer for their meals is then putting those people back in the drive-through line to get out of the property. Um, I, I do see the, the car wash also increasing. I mean, it'll be a new car wash. It, sh it should increase in business. Um, do I think that there's going to be so much traffic in the car wash that it's going to cause a huge traffic jam on its own? Probably not. I, I think I, I, I would believe that the comments that are made about the parking requirements and how many cars are going to be going in there and that you, you wouldn't necessarily have five or six cars um, trying to pull out of there um, at once. I, 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 will, I will definitely agree with that statement. Um, but I do worry a little bit more that those spaces along York um, are gonna be used more than more than they're saying and that people are going to be backing out um people who are waiting for their food from yorkies are going to be backing out of those spaces while you have people exiting the car wash and people exiting the drive through there's just a lot going on here um a lot and like i said i i, I don't feel super comfortable um with what's happening in terms of the safety and the traffic on the site if i can if i can add something uh, the way that we operate it right now and the way that everything flows right now, obviously we've been running it for a long time. So what we're proposing is we're obviously proposing a smaller car wash. We know that the, the, uh, the volume that that car wash does. And if we say that the, the business is going to increase again, uh, let's say if it increases double, that's still four cars an hour. So just keep that in mind as well. It's important to know too, if I may really fast, Yorkies, for those of you who have been there, and I'm sure many have, is known for their chicken plate, is known for a, a, a wonderful prepared meal at a reasonable price. It's not a McDonald's type place where eight out of 10 people that go to McDonald's go through a drive through The drive through is a convenience. Uh, it will definitely be more than the pickup, but I would seriously doubt that you would see more than four cars or six cars at its peak around that 
uh, queue that you see there, that huge line of cars going all the way around. You know, Yorkie's is still a destination type restaurant. 70% of their business is people that literally walk in and order their chicken plate, their gyros, their skirt steak, and very rarely buy a hot dog or a hamburger there, right? Am I right, John? Correct, yeah. So I think the drawing is, again, deceiving as to so many cars in that picture. Yeah. And along those lines, let me just add one last thing. Uh, I know you guys have been exposed to traffic studies and what we use, us as engineers, what we use for estimating traffic. That's the Institute of Transportation Engineers, or ITE, Trip Generation Manual. We got the data from the ITE for a restaurant of this size with no drive-through versus a restaurant of this size adding the drive-through. And the increase in traffic, it's at 10 additional cars. You might say, why? And it's exactly what it was mentioned here. It's a convenience. You have an established restaurant. Some people will take advantage of the drive-through. That will reduce the parking demand because instead of getting out of the car parking going in, they'll take that. But some people will continue going in because they want to experience the restaurant on the inside, sitting down or ordering. So just because you have a drive-through, it doesn't necessarily mean that your traffic is going to double now. So it's so, so it's a it's an increase, but it's not as bad as what you think. Okay, Commissioner Snyder, and then Commissioner McCoy. Thank you, Chair Rose. Yes, hi. So. You know, in my experience as an industrial designer is that you can design and, and lay out a, a traffic circulation plan for people to follow, but what typically happens is they, they follow the path of least resistance. And once they become familiar with the site, they um, attempt to take shortcuts or whatever that, that might be, they might consider more convenient for them. So uh, that brings me to this next question, which is um, the self-serve car wash is it two way if if someone you know a regular becomes really familiar and they're driving south on york road and you know they might figure out to just zip through the yorkies parking lot and come into the car wash so is the car wash two way or is oh, it it's a one way and there's no possibility for someone to come in on the rear side no I, yes hold on hold on yes because the doors will be will be the the doors will be open so yes if you want to disregard the do not enter sign that will be placed on the building. Yes, I guess you can do that. Okay, so you will have signage posted that says do not enter the car. Correct, mm -hmm. we, we do have those right now. Uh, and yes, we will have them on the new car wash, correct. Okay. And then I'm wondering, you have the four reservoir spaces to vacuum out the vehicles. Um, how many of your customers typically vacuum out their cars prior to getting a car wash or do you have data on that? Uh, so we do own, we do own a, uh, a car wash, uh, down the street, uh, gem car wash, uh, and that's an express exterior car wash. I would say 50, 50, 50, 50. Okay. Correct. Um, so right. you know, some people prefer to do it before some people, you know, uh, 50% would do it before 50% would do it after, uh, would you expect people to vacuum their cars after this, using this car wash? Correct, yes, yep. I okay. mean, the experience that we have with this car wash right now, absolutely. right now, the way that the vacuums are laid out, it, they're, lay, they're basically in the middle of the parking lot, so it really congests everything. So you got people that are trying to vacuum the car, and then you got people trying to use the base, they're, they're going around it, and it's just very inefficient the way that it was built. Well, I'm wondering if the, because um, there's a 90 degree angle between the vacuum bays and the car wash bays and the northernmost vacuum bay and the westernmost car wash bay are really in conflict with one another mm -hmm. in terms of customers, you know, whether or not they, they vacuum before or after a car wash. So that just introduces another um, point of congestion and conflict. So... I'm just trying to figure out um, how that that made sense to to put those bays in that or you know in orientation that they are next well, to you, them. You're oh, you're that, under the assumption that that's all going at by the exact same time. Someone data. is pulling in to wash their car and someone is vacuuming. There's five bays. We we've shown you that we don't think all five bays are going to rock and roll constantly. There's four vacuums, so that 
brief little conflict that you're addressing, which obviously we see clearly, we feel is 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 negligible point. It, it won't happen, or very rare if it will. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, based on the sales and based on the volume that we do right now, we don't. We never. Yeah, it would right. never happen. You know, based we on the, think that the volume that. won't be high enough that the conflict will really be introduced. Exactly. Correct. Yes. Correct. Well, Okay, and then I just want to touch back and circle around onto a comment that Commissioner Pittman made about those two uh, back in Yorkies, those two parking spaces along York Road. I think it's highly problematic. Again, just going back to people taking the path of least resistance. Um, I think those two, you know, reservoir spots waiting to pick up their food I, on York Road are, are highly problematic and introduce a lot of temptation, if you will for people to just simply take a quick right um, and exit out the entrance. I, I just, I think that possibility should be eliminated um, if if that's possible to do that. I just, uh, I think that's highly problematic and it just introduces too much temptation. So well, I just- this was inspired with the circulation from Culver's. If you've ever been there, they're pulling your, they're queuing your car all the way up to the front. They are, but they also have an exit right there. So when the cars pull forward in front of Culver's, they can continue to pull forward to exit properly, whereas you only have an ingress. And I think that it's just, it's not the same as Culver's. It's definitely not the same layout. Um, well, we could definitely put do that, do that exit sign or hash it to where it would, you know, it would make sense or we can eliminate, we can. Yeah, I just think you need to design to remove it because the temptation's okay. there and for someone to circle all the way back around the building and, and pull happen. the cars back through the drive through I just think that that's not practical to expect that's people to follow the rules. Absolutely, we can, we can eliminate those if, if, if that's what, uh, we'll definitely be open to eliminate it. Would it be better if, if we, instead of just an ingress, we added an exit as well over there. Like if you've got if you've got space for it, it surely would be better. Then I mean, then it's like colors. We do have a current curb cut that handles that presently. We we're proposing to minimize that curb cut, providing more landscaping. But if you want, we can leave it the way it is and have that as an in and an out for those two cars. If you if you Okay. Feel that's better. We don't have an issue with that at all, right, John? Correct. Yes. Commissioner McCoy. Thank you, Chair Rose. Uh, my issue also is with that same ingress egress in that northern entrance to this parking lot. And if you make it in and out, the people that are going to be parked along the the northern edge there, and I drove through there several times today. There are people that back out while you're trying to come in and it's like, it, that's what's going to, if you're in that, those parking spots along the northern end side there and they're toward the front, their tendency is going to be to back out and go right out on York Street. They're not going to drive all the way around the back of um, Yorkies. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, uh, Chair Snyder, Snyder said, I'm sorry, it, it's the least resistance. I am not going to go all the way around the back. If I'm in one of those early front parking spaces, I'm going to go out that way. I just think those those two parking space spots in front, I don't care even if you can turn right to go out, making that ingress and egress is, is going to cause more traffic problems than, than not. So that's what I have to then say. We lose. Then we, we could just we could just eliminate them. We can uh, I guess put uh, green space on there or do something to where it's more appealing. Uh, Commissioner Burns. Thank you, Chair Rose. Uh, just a few thoughts. One is for those two parking spaces that are right along York Road. Would it be possible to put in uh, sort of a cur a curved curb? to the north of the northernmost space that would force you to, to come out and turn left and circulate around the building and prevent you from making a right-hand turn. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, we would be open to do that, of course. Yeah. An another uh, thought thing I'm thinking is 
uh, if you remember, we had the uh, McDonald's and the Burger King on Butterfield, just west of York, uh, a couple years ago, when they were putting in their double drive-through lanes. <clears throat> the current configuration, and I often drive th through there in the afternoon to get my Diet Coke. Um, <laughs> our office is near there, so um, there's a uh, wide access point off of uh, Butterfield. Now, there's the two lanes for the drive-through, but then there's an outboard lane that bypasses the drive-through uh, that's on the Burger King side. And there are uh, head-in spaces, or they might be 45 degree spaces uh, on the, uh, it would be the West property line. Now you can go all the way around or you can go through the bank parking lot behind. My point is that if you go, if you're coming around and let's say for whatever reason, you circulate back around and come in front of the McDonald's. As you come around, traffic can come in off of Butterfield. So you would have a similar mesh point as we're talking about here. And for the most part, I haven't encountered any severe problems with that. Uh, you know, the, the, most of the time there's not two different cars coming together right at the same time. Sometimes there is, and you just wait your turn. Somebody's coming off of Butterfield, so you, you wait, they come into the site, and you continue on your way. Uh, so with these uh, fast food uh, circulation issues, I, I think people are fairly reasonable drivers most of the time. Although I tell my kids parking lots are the worst places to drive. Um, another, question I get for the applicant is, uh, given a five bay car wash, do you, do you need three or four, you need four vacuum spaces? And would it be possible to move the new building south to the 40 foot setback line instead of being 48 feet north? Because that would give you eight more feet on the north side of the building, which might mitigate the uh, lanes of traffic meeting between the two buildings. Does that make sense? Moving the building further south toward Evergreen. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's right. Right one, sorry. Right. Yeah. Um, but that would mean right. losing the, the yeah. northernmost of the four vacuum slots. So you would, you would definitely lose a vacuum down to three then. Right, but if you're, let's say you double and you're doing four cars per hour, and 50% of them are using the vacuum, it's two per hour. So do you really need four, or could you use three? My real point is, could you move the building south by eight feet? Yeah. Sure, yeah, we'd be open to that. Okay, Commissioner Hoffman. Um, and th this is uh, piggybacking on Commissioner Burns' statement. If, if you did that and you pulled that back, you could potentially um, minimize the movement that Commissioner Schneider was uh, was addressing before at 50% truly do vacuum after maybe you have two vacuums on the far, what would that be, the um, north, uh, southwestern portion of the lot, maybe there are two vacuums, um, you know, further east. So then you're not you're not introducing that action of, of people who are vacuuming after crossing the traffic of the people who are coming into the car wash. Okay. Sure, we'll be open to that. Commissioner Garland. Um, I Commissioner Snyder brought up a, a really good point and something that I experienced in, in uh, my working uh, life, but the path of least resistance is very real. And so as you look at the, the parking, uh, the parking on the north side of the lot and perhaps the, the west side behind Yorkies, uh, just to facilitate the proper movement and traffic flow. And I'm not sure what the impact would be in terms of the number of spaces, but would highly, highly recommend that you angle those parking slots so that you know when you're backing out, you're faced 
in a way that won't direct you out to York, but you would you would be you would need to circle around the building. And so, I just throw that out as a as an observation, and uh, I that just to remove that that path of least resistance because you don't want you know a lot of cars coming. Be, especially with where your drive-through lane is at. If people are going to come in and go in the drive-through lane and people are going to be trying to get out, th that's where your mix up, uh, there's some mix up that could happen. So. And absolutely, we'll be, okay, we'll be okay with turning those into a 45, right? 45? Yeah, those are, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, Correct. That's a really good idea. Yeah. 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 Other comments, other questions from commissioners? Okay. I'm going to suggest that uh, given the hour and given the kinds of changes people have been talking about, that we would not deliberate this tonight, that we would get a revised site plan and be able to take a look at that. Does that make sense to other commissioners um, as opposed to deliberating this evening? It, people are talking about eliminating this, moving this building, go, yeah, that, that's... Um, but we have to be cautious. It can't be um, a substantive change to the site plan. If it is, they pretty much have to start all over. Correct, Eileen? Um, not necessarily, as long as like the variations don't increase or, um, okay. you know, I mean, because it's a conditional use for the drive through and a conditional use for the car wash. So we would just want to make sure that the variations don't don't increase from like the setback requirement. It can get larger, it just can't get smaller. Yeah, that makes sense. But it would seem to me that if we were to see some revision of that site plan, uh, it might make more sense uh, for deliberation. Does that make sense to most commissioners or would you, is there anyone who really thinks? Mr. Pittman? I think that makes a whole lot of sense. I think a lot of the suggestions, comments from some of the commissioners, especially um, Commissioner Burns um, idea of shifting car wash building south, that would make me feel a whole lot better about having a little bit more separation between those two uses um, and, and maybe reconfiguring those vacuum areas a little bit. Um, the, the numerous comments um, from Commissioner Garland about how to situate um, the the parking um, at an angle and also, you know, just keeping the flow of the traffic in that area for the drive through more efficient. I think that would dra dramatically change my opinion about this submittal. Sure. Things like where to put the order box, that there were a bunch of things in here. So um, I, I, it would certainly be helpful to me to see some revised piece with all of that. Commissioner McCoy, did you have a comment you wanted to make? No. Oh, okay. Commissioner Snyder? No, I agree. I, I don't think that it would be appropriate to deliberate this evening just based on the um, the, the quantity of, of revisions that we are we were discussing um, and questioning. So, yes, I'm in favor of, of waiting to see a revised plan. Well, I think it allows, I'm going to ask the applicant that, it allows you to go back um, and think about some of this discussion we've had tonight, some of the questions. Uh, some of it you may not be able to do, some of them you may not want to do, some of it you may have some ideas about how to better do that, but it seems to me, in essence, some of the strong concerns people have are that, uh, that these two uses uh, maybe are too intertwined, they're too close to each other. So anything you can do to get a little more space in that um, and I appreciate your comments. It's, you know, you can't mix apples and oranges here. You can't have a drive-through like Culver's, but have a menu that isn't like Culver's. It's not, that, that's, that's a problem, okay? Oh, yeah. um, and so some way to, uh, you know, Culver's has got those several places out front because they can make a right and, you know, your, your food's going to come in three minutes and there you go. But you're already saying that's not going to happen. So so if you can think through, some, uh, there, I think I would group some of the concerns here are the, um, the closeness of these two uses, uses really invites conflict when uh, if it was separated, maybe perhaps there would be less. To look at those 
ingress and egress because that that is a decision point for us when we look at conditional use and variances really the ingress and egress that's that's a major major point for us to look at and make decisions on but those are the kinds of things uh, for you to really think through a little bit more and come back uh, with a bit of a revised plan that may may get us to something that we all feel a little more comfortable about. Does that make sense to you or are you willing to consider Absolutely. that? Absolutely. We have, we have no problem with it. We'd like to work with you guys and obviously make, you know, do it to where it makes sense, of, you know, for everybody and also, you know, have it be successful in the end. So look, yeah, I mean, look, we really want to work with you. It's like if I were to poll this group, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Yorkies. You know, I've been, I've been there a lot and, and I understand okay, your that. pickup window isn't, you know, it's it, converting that to a drive up window. That's a major change that you're talking about. Um, and that's going to change your operations. And I know that it's my understanding is that that's what has spurred you to think that way is, is the current pandemic, but changing your business model, is that something you really want to do based on the pandemic? Uh, is it not? Is it, you know, you guys are the ones who know this business better than I do. I'm, I'm, this is not my business, but of course. You know, just think it through and just hear our concerns. And I think if you can, you know, we really want to get to a place where uh, we can work together on this and make Absolutely. it happen. We're going to do so, a little brainstorming and we're going to see you guys on the next, on the next meeting. The next step. Well, she'll give us, she'll give you a date on that. Okay. And, and and I know that, you know, you may think, oh, gosh, this is so ponderous, for goodness sakes, you know, but uh, really, once you start asking for conditional use and variances, you know, uh, you, we follow a timeline that's going to be a little more uh, elongated than your timeline. But if you'll bear with us, uh, I think that we will have something that uh, will work a little better for everybody and help you be successful, which is what we really want. Last thing I want is to see Yorkie's clothes. Trust me. I don't know. <laughs> where, where would I go for my uh, gear? Oh, so. <laughs> the chicken plate's good too. <laughs> so, Absolutely, yeah. so does that make sense uh, to the rest of the commissioners that we do it that way? Then I, I, I'm going to suggest that is what we do. So would that mean we continue the public hearing? I, I think it does. Yes, I would recommend we continue it to the first meeting in May if the applicant is, you know, hopefully the applicant will be ready by then. But our, our next meeting is reserved for Roberto's. So it would be continued to May 4th. May 4th. Okay, sure. So all right, if that's then, then we will uh, end this portion of the public hearing and we will continue it until May 4th. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing, uh, you know, the results of your own thinking on this too. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate thank your time. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Emily, thank, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So let's move on to the next, uh, the last piece uh, is other business. Do we have any other business, Eileen? Uh, just that our next meeting will be on the 20th. We will be continuing the Roberto's public hearing. And then our first meeting in May is starting to, to get pretty full as well. So um, we're, we're staying staying busy with cases. Good. I think we're staying busy, but you know, my goal is that we keep moving along, is that we're trying to be efficient in this. I don't want to run it through so quickly that people don't have a chance to really think through and plan, but um, we want to keep things moving. So okay. Uh, seeing that there's no other business, uh, let me entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, okay, uh, Commissioner Burns moves. Commissioner well, Ditsky, second. Uh, you have a question? I have a question. But I'm All right, well, I'll, I'll go through to the motion. But the um, question is for Roberto's. Uh, the applicant is, I believe, preparing rebuttal to the Elmer's Neighbors United presentation. And do we have any further idea when that would be ready? So I know he is working on his draft. Um, I'm anticipating it will be ready sometime next week. 
I will see if I can get an update on that. I'm also working on a memo for the commission that I'm hoping to have ready next week. So as soon as I have a better idea on that, I will let you know. So we're thinking in terms of April 20th will be deliberation. I think that April 20th will have to be continued public hearing. I, I don't know. I don't know if you will get to deliberation that night or not until we see what the applicant responds with. Uh, right. I my, would agree. My recall yeah, yeah. was that he said he was just going to submit a written rebuttal. Correct. Okay. All right. We'll see. But, but that doesn't, I mean, we still are open in public hearing with that. So also he has the, um, the, the folks also, the public also has an opportunity to re uh, open up more testimony based on that rebuttal too. So we, it's not for sure that we would deliberate that night. I, I couldn't guarantee that. We'll have to see. A question, uh, Commissioner McCoy. Okay, okay. So how many rebuttals are we going to go through? I mean, like, okay, the petitioner offers his rebuttal, then the Citizens United or the Neighbors United, they offer rebuttal, then do we go, is there at some point that we say that's the end? Uh, there will, there is a point, but I've been advised by the city attorney, it's not yet. Oh. So, I mean, that's been my very question is that, okay, how much back and forth is there? Um, and there, there will come a point where we can say that's sufficient, but uh, not at this point. If, if it's not just if any of them bring in new material, that's possible. You know, they they may in, and certainly if uh, uh, Mr. Day brings in new material, then we probably would not deliberate. So um, I, I think it's just going to depend. There will come a point at which we're we're going to be able to say that. That's, that's it, we're, we're done with this. I mean, not, not we're done. I don't mean to say that like I'm washing my hands of it, but uh, that it, it really is the time then to move on to deliberation. There absolutely will. So I've been trying to work pretty closely with the city attorney uh, who's been, this is Andy Acker, who's been very, very helpful to us uh, to make sure that we are dotting our I's and crossing our T's where all this is concerned, so. That's the best answer I can give you. So other questions or concerns about that? Okay. All right. Then I the motion to adjourn. I Commissioner, move, uh, Commissioner Burns moved. A second? Uh, Commissioner Snyder. Well, I, I thought Commissioner Dinsky too, so. All right. Uh, all those, uh, you're going to have to call the roll. We'll have to call the roll again. Uh, right. Commissioner Burns. Yes. Commissioner Garland. Yes. Commissioner Hoffman. Yes. Commissioner McCoy. Yes. Commissioner Pittman. Yes. Commissioner Snyder. Sorry, I went out of order. Commissioner Snyder. Yes. Commissioner Ruditsky. 